Okay, we're recording. Thank you. Uh, good evening. It's November 18th, 2024. It's a regular meeting of the town council from 5 to 5 30, 6.30. We will be holding a reading period on the town manager's evaluation documents. At 6.30, we will recess the regular meeting for a public forum on the FY26 budget. At 7 or soon thereafter, as possible, we will convene the public forum on the supplemental budget appropriations. And the regular town council will meeting will resume following the two public forums at approximately 7.30. I'm not gonna go through all the open meeting law stuff. I'll do that later. Uh, we do have a quorum of the council present. I'm going to call the council meeting to order at 5.01. And I'm going to check if you're not on Zoom, but you're in the room, please just use your mic. Pat DeAngelis is absent at this point. Anna Devlin Gotham. Present. Uh, Councillor Ette is not here yet. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord is not here yet. Um, Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. And Councillor Walker is not here yet. I'm not going to interrupt the meeting to announce when people come. I will note that when they arrive and I will um, make sure that uh, I note the time they arrive. I just, first of all, very quickly want to thank all of you. I'm sorry. Hi, Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I want to thank all the council for submitting your forms to me. Uh, I'd like to take a time to fa familiarize the members of the council with the documents that we have just posted. They include the individual evaluations of the town manager as submitted by each of the 13 councilors. Hala, if Councilor Lord, if you would just press your button and say present. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lord is present. Um, a compilation of all of the individual ratings, and notice I said ratings and comments are now in one document. That is the document that I would suggest you spend your time with because it has everything that's on individuals. The final document is the first, and I do mean first, and I do mean the word draft of the town manager's evaluation submitted to him by the town council through the president. This is a document we will discuss later in the meeting. As you are aware, compiling and then summarizing all of this information can only be done by one person. As that person, I ask the following, please check and make sure that when I transferred stuff from your evaluation to the composite document that I did everything correctly. The second thing is, we, once we get started this evening, I'll give you a deadline by which I want you to send me and only me changes to the document, okay? With that, I just wanna note that you turn your screen off, turn your sound off. Um, the screen up front will say that we're in a reading session and um, please go ahead.
هست
In a few minutes, we're going to recess the regular council and move on to the public forum. Athena, we're going to get ready to record at 6.30. We're recording the entire evening all in one Oh, that's video, right. So we don't need to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Those of you that are in the room or on the council on Zoom, uh, you should start putting your cameras back on and get your video ready and your voice. Councilor at table, sure I can. Thank you. Andy, you ready? Okay. Alicia, are you there? Okay. Good evening. It is November 18th, 2024. The regular meeting of the town council is in recess while we actually convene this public forum on the FY26 budget. There is another forum following this. And if you plan to speak publicly about that, that's a different sign up. And then later, if you plan to speak in general public comment, that's yet a different sign up. Okay. Um, the open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, we have more than a quorum in the room tonight. Um, th this meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and is live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the November 18th public forum.
on the FY26 budget to order at 631. Everything okay, Anna? Oh, that was so <laughs> orange. Oh, wow. Lynn? My Lynn, point of order. Uh, it, uh, yes. So I'm going to call the council to order and then ask you to call the finance committee to order. Thank you. I will call upon each councilor by name. Please indicate that you are, can hear us and we can hear you. Pat DeAngelis is absent. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councilor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councilor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. I'm here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councilor Walker. Here. Thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please make sure that Athena and I know. And please use your raised hand button if you want to ask a question or make a comment. There will be a public comment period during this public forum as it relates to the FY26 budget. There will be another public comment period during the next forum on the appropriations outside the budget for FY25. And there'll be a general public comment period during the regular meeting, which will resume at approximately 7.30 upon completion of both forums. With that, we're going to move quickly to a brief presentation on the FY26 budget. Uh, Town Manager Paul Bachman. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you all for being here. I'm joined tonight by Melissa Zodwatsky, who is our finance director. Sorry, Melissa, I always stumble. Um, this is a public forum, which is a, a, on our budget, and we make a very brief presentation. It's basically a subset of the presentation that we made um, at the Financial Indicators pro, uh, presentation on November 4th, but we take a few slides out and we make that presentation because tonight really is about listening to the public and hearing um, what you have to say, what values you want to bring and the priorities that you want to bring. Um, we used to do this forum in the spring, and but a lot of the decisions were already made. This is before decisions are made, before the, fin before the Finance Committee and the Town Council have issued their financial guidelines, before we've really started getting, getting into our budget. So it's really an important time. I appreciate everyone who's been here. Um, this is a team approach. You want to do the slides? Yeah. Well, not to worry. So this is a team approach. So Melissa, I mean, I want to just call out Melissa. She's been here about four months, and she's already dug into a lot of this information on multiple levels. So I really appreciate the work that she has done. And she's been working with our comptroller, Holly, Holly Drake, um, and uh, our treasurer collector, Jen LaFountain and uh, Athena O'Keefe as well. So uh, it's, it's a real team effort and we look forward to talking to you and listening to you tonight. Um, so the major challenges that we are Paul, facing- I'm yeah. gonna pause for just sure. a moment. I forgot to ask Bob to call the finance oh, committee sorry. meeting to order. I'm calling the finance committee uh, to order. Uh, all five counselors are present. None of the uh, resident members are present. Uh, that's not true. Bernie is Bernie's in the audience. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have checked on all the members. Thank you. Yeah, Paul, please go ahead. Audience. Great. Thank you. Oh, so, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. He he is here. He's in the meeting. Bernie, can you hear? You're muted. Yes, I can. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is a, a summary of what we are talking about tonight. We have major challenges facing the town. And one of the challenges we have is that uh, we have these major capital projects that we're working for, towards. We have pressure on taxpayers. Um, we have new staff at both the schools and the town hall. And you will hear this over and over that we are basically as a town, a three to 4% community. That's how much more money we get on a regular basis. And it goes back for years. We, we generally are in the range of three to 4%. Our needs are much higher than that. We recognize that, but that's, we can only spend the money that we get. Um, we also recognize the pressure that the economy has on our, is placing on our taxpayers. 
so our mission as staff is to encourage fiscal stability without, and the idea being that if we don't have strong financial systems in place and financial uh, um, um, uh, resources, nothing is possible. So we really do need to maintain our fiscal discipline. Important accomplishments is that we do are in a very strong financial position. This has been purposeful. We've been working for years to get ourselves into a position where we will we are able to take on the major debt projects that we have coming up, which are the school, the library, the police, the fire, and the um, DPW. That means that we have been shedding debt so that we can take on new debt. We've been building up our reserves over time, and we've been carving out space in our budget for capital expenses. Um, we are continuing to focus on growing our reserves and we have a approved FY25 budget plus a strategic partnership agreement with UMass. Uh, that was in last year. Um, we are our solid financial foundation. Um, we, have, we, uh, we have excellent financial management and you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at what Standard & Poor's, our, our bond rating agency says about us. We have good financial systems, strong working relationships between the town and the schools. And I, I talked about the team approach to, to solving problems. So next slide. So what we're gonna do now, or Melissa is, is this is the spreadsheet that we use throughout the course of the year. This shows our FY22 actual, FY23 actual, FY24 actual, our FY25 budget, and what we're projecting for FY26. We start with revenues and we look, look at all the different categories of the revenues. And then the next sheet you see will be our expenditures. And you'll see, and we're always, at this point, we're early in the budget cycle. So we usually have a deficit and that's not, that, that's not unusual, that's sort of common at this point in time. So Melissa, you wanna walk through this? Sure, so this is um, the projection sheet that um, like Paul said, we will continue to show um, every month or two to give updates on where we are in our projections. Uh, like Paul stated, we are fairly early on in our projections and these are preliminary numbers um, based on um, kind of what we know right now. We will have a lot more information in the beginning of the new year in January because by then we'll have um, fully set our tax rate for this fiscal year. Um, uh, the the tax classification hearing was last meeting. And so we are working on get generating those tax bills for fiscal year and churning up those numbers. And the new growth number will be um, sustain, you know, set, and then we'll be able to build off of that going into future years. Um, also in January, we will get um, information from the state on what our state aid will be. And, you know, we are all hopeful that it will increase and that will help us move along. And then we'll also have about six months history of what's happened so far in fiscal 25 so that we can better project um, our more um, fluctuating receipts like local receipts and uh, motor vehicle excise. I do wanna comment that this, while our projections have not changed from two weeks ago, the spreadsheet has been updated to reflect some feedback that we received from council members um, and information we have on on the closeout of the fourth quarter report is called that um, Holly Drake prepared for us. And so on the second sheet, you'll see that the totals have changed and that we balance them to the fourth quarter report. And essentially the, the lines that changed was how we reported transfers in from free cash um, that happened last year. So we just wanted to, you know, pull that to everyone's attention, but it didn't really change the bottom line all, just the way that we reported in a way that I hope is more understandable and will bring less questions. So if you wanna to go to the next report, you can see that we are still showing a deficit of uh, around 300,000. That is um, not uncommon at this time of year. I don't anticipate that we will have any problem closing that gap. Um, it's just more of where do we close it from based on the more um, up-to-date information we'll have in a few months. So uh, this is um, a slide that we did in the uh, economic um, or financial indicators presentation a few weeks ago. And this um, slide is really around the receipts that we received that are reflection of economic growth in the community and 
honestly, in our uh, local and greater economy. Um, and so these, um, these revenues that we look at that fluctuate um, are building permits, uh, the new growth that I spoke of earlier, this is new construction here in town. If we have a new um, business building come in or if there's a new apartment complex or, or maybe even um, several new homes, a uh, new cul-de-sac, what have you. Um, and then a motor vehicle excise is a reflection of the economy. You know, we all buy new cars when we're feeling good, right? And so um, then uh, meals tax and hotel and motel tax are, um, were impacted greatly by um, the pandemic. And so they dropped in 20 and 21, but are starting to recover now. Um, I will say that we were on a steady growth of, um, of, the, of these revenues until the pandemic where it dipped slightly and then we've been recovering steadily since. And there's sort of an anomaly in this scale because in 2023, there was a lot of um, one-time money put into the budget um, specifically for the um, school building project that skews the percentage of the overall revenue um, in this area. But the truth is that dollar for dollar, it was on the rise, which you can see in the next slide actually. Multitasking. So, so here you can see that um, the the largest um, contributor to our um, re revenue in the town is property taxes, and you can see that it grows the most consistently, um, but is not keeping up very well with um, inflation or what we call the constant dollar. So you can see the the gap between the money that we receive and um, inflation is is not keeping up as well. The other um, state aid is keeping up fairly well, although there is a gap there as well. And the um, local receipts, which are um, economy driven, send, tend to stay closer to um, inflation because those numbers kind of drive off in, of inflation numbers. Um, but you can see the dip in, um, in that revenue source um, in the pandemic and that we're slowly uh, rising out of that. But again, that is the uh, smallest contributor to our uh, revenues in the town. So it's back to me. So we're in FY25. That's the fiscal year that began July 1 and ends June 30th of 2025. And, I, and what we can, the budget for this year went up 4% for uh, the town, the schools and all the entities. And we have been able to maintain our investment in capital and sustainability. But we have some significant challenges coming for, towards us. Inflation, everyone recognizes the challenges of inflation. Um, the regional assessment for the regional school district is something that has to be an active conversation now. And I, I compliment the um, superintendent for beginning that conversation very early in her tenure. It's an important conversation. Um, we have you have heard that healthcare costs are we're estimating are going up 13 percent it could go up more the our uh, accountant person said it could be 10 to 15 percent we'll know what that number is come january and that will we'll be able to lock those percentages in come january uh, retirement and oped liabilities we are continue to have responsibilities to meet those liabilities uh, and then we're also looking to grow the tax base to support the demand for new services so we get we we start uh, as a revenue. How much money do we have coming in from taxes and all the different sources? The only way we get new taxes is by two and a half percent over um, what we're paying now, plus any new growth. New growth is a new building going up, a new swimming pool in someone's house, a new deck in someone's house, things like that. That means that's new and that can be taxed, and that's called new new growth. Next slide. And so the sort of the similar thing. So as, as we look forward, we're looking at continuing that expansion of the tax base because our needs exceed the money that we have coming into us across the board. Um, we, want, we want to maintain our commitment to reducing the town's carbon footprint, 
we want to maintain our fiscal discipline so we can um, be able to do those four capital projects. Um, and again, I recognize that our needs outweigh our resources and that there are always new initiatives that people want to take on. And it's a very hard thing to say no when we don't have the funds for that. So the way we're moving forward with that is to manage our, manage our resources frugally, um, you know, make a prudent use of our reserves um, and maintain and encourage development in the town that meets our the, the goals of the of the community. Yeah. So this is I just want to show you the budget map. Do you want to talk to this? Or you want me to? Sure. So talking about um, the key upcoming dates for this budget year. Um, we've already had the financial indicators presentation to the council, the school committee, the regional school committee, and the Jones trustees. Tonight, we're hearing from members of the public on the upcoming budget about their um, wishes and priorities. Then the finance committee will begin to develop the council's budget guidelines. That's when the council essentially tells the town manager what it would like to see in the upcoming budget. So the uh, it's great to see a lot of turnout tonight. Um, because this is your opportunity to tell your elected leaders what you would like to see in the budget as they develop their budget guidelines. Um, in December, the Finance Committee will present those guidelines to the Council for adoption. There will be periods of public comment at those meetings as well. And then the Town Manager will begin to develop the budget. In the spring, um, the Joint Capital Planning Committee will convene and hear capital, plan, uh, capital requests from departments and members of the public. Um, I believe the capital request form is currently active. So if any members of the public have an idea of something, a capital request that they'd like to make of the town, they can submit that online. Um, and then we'll have, once the budget is presented to the council, we'll have a public hearing on that proposed budget. Uh, the finance committee will conduct its review. And, uh, and then the, the council will take action on the budget in June of next year. And I think this is sort of uh, the opportunity for when people can be involved and it's starting today. This is a perfect time to start communicating your 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 goals, your interests and your values to the town council. And there's different ways to do that. You can write to the town council, you can write to the town manager. Um, and then there's the public hearing next tonight. And then back in May, there'll be another public hearing. It, there'll be a public hearing on capital uh, projects as well in the spring of 2025. And that concludes our report. Thank you. Uh, we are going to move to public comment. The, and let me just mention at this point, if you um, would like to make public comment and you are in the room, please, on this issue, please make sure that you would sign up with Athena, who is over here. If you're in the audience and you would like to make public comment on the FY25 26, I'm sorry, budget, please raise your hand now. A Zoom audience for hands. Thanks, Vince. I'm sorry if you're on Zoom. I have 13 in the room. Before we begin public comment, I just wanna make sure that you all understand this is not the only way to make public comment to us, and it is not the only time. You can always email the council at towncouncil at amherstma.com. You can submit general public comment at any time, and counselors are totally available directly through their emails, in some cases phone, and through district meetings and any no number of other ways. Um, public comment, um, you said you have 13 up there? That's correct. And right now I have 10 and I'm going to hold it. Um, wait, got one more coming in, 12, 13. Okay.
just to prepare yourselves at this point, we are going to have to limit public comment to two minutes, uh, given the number of people both in the audience, in the town room and on Zoom. Uh, public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to two minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on matters raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. I also want to point out that the First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak, and to express themselves, including their right to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of imminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of freedom of speech. We'll recognize speakers in the order in which they have signed out. We'll begin with the room. And when you come up, make sure that the light is green on the thing and make sure you state your name and generally where you live in Amherst, okay? Rachel so Hall, please come up. And if you would just make sure you speak close to the microphone so everyone can hear you, thank you. And can we have the timer up? Thanks for the smiles, I'm nervous. Um, I'm Rachel, I use she, her pronouns. I live near here in Amherst. <laughs> I won't tell you my exact neighborhood. Um, I am a mom of two little nuggets, age nine and 11. And when we were deciding where to move in the Pioneer Valley, I was told that the Amherst schools are the best um, for a variety of details, and I won't go into it. Um, and I'm really here. Um, I put pants on. I have a work meeting at eight o'clock. I worked all day. There's a burger in the oven. Like, I really didn't want to spend my night doing this necessarily, not that I don't appreciate everyone who is, but I'm really, really here to just ask that we have a town budget that prioritizes the needs of our K through 12 population and that that is, you know, reflected throughout our financial um, spending. It's really, really important to me. And I know it's really important to a lot of kids, um, especially post pandemic to let our kids down now just feels heartbreaking. So thank you all for your time and thank you for listening. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Um, Julian Ramirez, you are in Zoom. Please enter the room, state your name, and generally where you live. Good evening. My name is Julian Ramirez. I live in Amherst. I'm the parent of two kids at Fort River. Um, I'm here tonight to speak as someone who believes in the value of public education, as a parent who's fed up with watching our schools suffer while this town continues to devalue it. The budget cuts we've seen in recent years, cuts to special programs and resources, they're not just numbers on a page. These cuts are hurting our children. They're robbing our kids of opportunities. They're taking away support from the most vulnerable, usually the most mar marginalized students in our schools. And what's worse, there's an ongoing threat of more cuts. More programs at risk, more resources stripped away, and this has to stop. Listen to your community, our children, our teachers, our staff deserve better, better than what you're giving them right now. They deserve schools that are properly funded, not schools that are constantly left scraping for resources. I wanna express my support also for the coming out this program at Fort River. This program isn't just about learning a second language. It's about connecting our Spanish speaking families to their children's education. As an immigrant myself, I can tell you firsthand how difficult it is to overcome the language barrier. My own parents struggled to communicate with my school, and they never felt fully involved in my education. They never had a program like Coming On This to help them. This program is a lifeline for families like mine. It's a vital connection between the school and the community. If you care about inclusivity, you'll support it, not just with words, but with real funding. There's a surplus in this town, and it's time to stop making excuses. That money should go to our schools, not next year, not in some long-term plan, but now, right now. Our kids are waiting, teachers are waiting, families are waiting. Thank you very much. 
Jillian, thank you for joining us. Next, we have Becca Watkins. Hi, I'm Becca and I live in Echo Hill. I have two kids in the Fort River School District. Uh, like Rachel, we moved here about two years ago and we chose Amherst because for many reasons and many reasons that I love, uh, but one of the reasons was because the public education system was supposed to be top notch. I've been pretty disappointed uh, since we've moved here in our schools through no fault of the teachers, um, but in where we place our priorities. Uh, I'm a product of public education. I taught in public education, and I would love to see my kids and everyone else's children benefit from the same. So I'm asking you to prioritize our schools when you consider the budget. Becca, thank you for joining us. Jajna Rega, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, uh, Josna Rege, District 1. Josna, your, your volume is a little bit low. Can you speak closer to your microphone, please? Josna Rege, District 1. How's that? Slightly better. better. Ah. My son attended the Amherst schools from 1990 to 2003. Can you hear me? Yes. 12. And during that time, Amherst had one of the best public school systems in the state on a par with Brookline. People, including my husband and I, moved to Amherst because of both the high quality and the relative diversity of its school system, with small classes, innovative and holistic teaching methods, instruction in many languages, electives, music and the arts, independent studies, anything a student needed with advocacy, there were resources to support it. My parents also retired to Amherst in the 1990s, and although they were on fixed incomes, they never complained about supporting the school budget. They felt responsible to do so on principle, even though they personally didn't have children in the schools. 20 years later, my husband and I are retired and on a fixed income. We no longer have a child in the public schools, but I've watched wave after wave of cuts degrade our school system. And although I'm glad my own son experienced the Amherst schools in their heyday, I'm saddened to see the situation as it is currently. Like my parents before me, I still support funding to maintain the quality of our schools, especially for the students most in need. I supported the construction of the new school building, even though it will drive up my already high taxes. But a state-of-the-art building alone does not guarantee a good education without the teachers and support staff to provide it. Please prioritize our schools in the town manager's budget guidelines for FY26. Include the full amount allocated to the regional schools this year in the base for calculating next year's increase. Allocate as much money as possible to our schools this year and prioritize operating budgets over surplus generation. Supporting our children's education- Your time is up. Is more important. Thank you, Thank you for joining us, Jasmine. Uh, Kathleen Mitchell. Hi, my name is Kathleen Mitchell. I'm a resident of District 5. Um, first, I want to thank all of you for your recent state level advocacy regarding school funding um, and for opposing the expansion of PBCICS. These are important steps toward providing long term relief for our public schools. But what I want to ask tonight is whether the town of Amherst is doing as much as it can for our public schools and especially our regional schools. I think that parents are tired of hearing that the region is a separate municipality. Um, for which the town feels minimally responsible. Our children do not cease to be Amherst residents when they transition to the seventh grade and rhetoric and funding should reflect this fact. We need our town officials to work cooperatively with school leadership to address the crisis facing our schools. This goes beyond the annual percentage increase that requ and requires a more holistic view of funding. As a community, we are setting aside a large amount of tax money for capital needs every year, but comparatively little of this reaches our schools on an ongoing basis. 
This year, 95% of JCPC funds went to the municipal expenditures, adding $6 million to that side of the budget. The town is using some of this money for regular building maintenance and routine replacement of IT equipment, but for the regional schools, it appears that many of these same costs come out of the operating budget. This imbalance should be examined and corrected. Our schools are at a breaking point, which should be of great concern to all of us. Our town master plan says that our schools are essential, not just for our children, but in order to maintain strong property values and an overall quality of life. I hope that the FY26 budget guidelines will reflect these values and priorities and that we can see a shift in tone when it comes to the regional schools. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Kathleen. Marisol Bonifaz, please enter the room, state your name and generally where you live. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can, but please speak to the mic. Thank you. Sounds good. Apologies. I'm in a public library. Um, good, e good evening. Uh, my name is Marisol Pierce Bonifaz, and I'm a resident of District 1 in Amherst, a member of Sunrise Amherst, and a senior at Amherst Regional High School. I have spoken to this council countless times to demand our school funding, yet without prevail. I am appalled by our complete lack of prioritization of school funding in each year's physical budget as our education, the next generation's education, is fundamental to the Amherst community. As a high schooler and as an 18 year old in the school system, I have seen firsthand how the budget cuts have strained our staff and our quality of education. Our guidance counselors are forced to take on more work. And as we no longer have a long-term sub, our teachers are forced to use their prep periods to look after a class. At least once a week, we have a desperate sounding announcement from the administration on the coverage of a class from a teacher who is supposed to be using that time to prepare and grade. This is not how education works. As well, the Caminantes program, of which my mother works in at Fort River, I have seen firsthand is crucial for students and empowering them in two languages, of which helps their education and does not hurt their education, despite what some may think. As a Spanish speaker myself, yo creo que es muy importante para todo de su vida y para todo el idioma de todo. And this is also important for access and accessibility in these meetings, which we should have translation for. And this is not how our education system works. This is not how it should look like. And on behalf of Sunrise Amherst and from my seven years in the Amherst School District, of which I will be graduating from this year, I implore you to prioritize our school mending. These cuts are detrimental. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Marisol. Jaya Bajpai. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, great. Thank you. Good evening, members of the community, of council members and city staff. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Jaya Bajpai. I'm a new area resident in the Amherst Pelham area. Um, I'll start by saying that as the former chief financial officer of a $400 million revenue agency, I was extremely impressed to see uh, the town's high credit rating and the very small percentage of revenues that go towards debt service. It's a sign of prudent fiscal management, and it's an opportunity for this community to reflect on its strategic priorities and what it wants to be. I agree entirely with city staff that this town needs to diversify its economic base. The reality is um, three large institutions are tax exempt, and therefore a large proportion of the budget falls on property taxes, right? And Housing, by the way, is one of the largest assets in, in the average American family's portfolio. In that context, I would urge you to consider the fact that many families, like my own, family of four, biracial, uh, brown, white, two gorgeous little children, don't say otherwise, moved here because of the schools. I'm too old to party with college kids. Too much gray hair, right? Others you have heard from have said the same. I think it's a time and an opportunity for this council, this town, and this staff to thoughtfully reflect on its priorities and to consider an investment in schools, an investment in its economic foundation, an investment in its base, an investment in doing exactly what staff are asking you to do, which is diversify the base, build a foundation for the future. All of that starts with the schools. When my family and I buy a house, if you yeah, buy a hammer, I see the time. Okay. Um, 
we will automatically raise property taxes, right? That will address that inflation adjusted property thing. You want more folks like us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Bertie, please enter the room, state your full name and where you live. Hello, my name is Bertie Newman. I'm a resident of District 3. I'm commenting to call on the town government to prioritize the full funding of our schools and of the recommendations from parts A and B of the Community Safety Working Group report for the upcoming fiscal year. In particular, I want to draw attention to the importance of a BIPOC-led youth empowerment center. Young people of color in Amherst need a space where they are safe and comfortable to learn, relax, and build community. In my mind, this is particularly salient as we approach a second Trump presidency. Additionally, I am calling on the town government to move money out of policing. Initiatives to meet the needs of our community, support our youth, and develop unarmed responses to emergent situations will go a long way toward making our community safe without relying on surveillance and punishment. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Bertie. Jacinta Smith, please. Good night, my name is Jacinta Smith. I live on College, College Street in Amherst. I am a committee member of the Human Rights Committee um, of the town of Amherst. Over the last year, we have led community events to promote, educate our community about the diversity of cultures that reside here in Amherst. These events have been well received by our residents. With each successful event, we are asked to sponsor more. And this encompasses only one of our missions as a committee. We are also a resource for people who have felt their human rights have been violated in this town and for organizations that seek volunteers and co-sponsorships to help address these issues in our community. After our meeting last evening on November 16th, 2024, we identified that with the incoming presidential administration and nearby instances of people with proper citizenship and undocumented status being at risk in our community, of further violations of human rights. Um, our load of projects, both in amount and responsibility are going to increase and we need funding. We currently have zero um, in the budget. And as partners with the DEI office, and as you consider next year's budget, we are asking for the town's financial support for both the Human Rights Commission and the DEI, DEI office. We are asking the town budget to support our committee and allocate around 5,000 to 7,000 for our committee budget as we prepare to help support local organizations by hosting information panels on immigration, creating a DEI video for local businesses and local government bodies, and hosting cultural events. The remaining will be fundraised or donated into the HRC gift fund. And with my remaining time, the costs cover but are not limited to child care services and supplies, decorations, janitorial services, translation services, um, and these costs range from as little as $250 to up to $7,000. Jessica, thank you for your service on HRC and for joining us tonight. Jacinta. Jacinta, Jacinta. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, for correcting me. Alex Lopez, please enter the room, state your name, where you live. Hi, my name is Alex Lopez. Uh, I live on Potwine Lane, um, and I've got three Crocker farmers. Um, I echo what so many people have said already about why Amherst was an attractive space for us to move to. Um, it's why we're here in terms of education, in terms of diversity. Um, one thing I wish people had warned me about before moving to Amherst was this pattern of the town council continuously feeling very powerful when it's being presented its budget numbers and then claiming powerlessness when people ask them to make up the deficits that they've planned into that budget for our K through 12 schools. And so this is not the first presentation that I've watched the budget be broken down into, we have strong capital reserves, uh, or we have strong reserves, we have strong investments in capital, um, and we're gonna continue doing things the way that we are and those strategies are working for us. And then when people say those strategies aren't working for us, namely they aren't working for our schools, they aren't working for our kids, 
they aren't working for the staff in there, suddenly people are turning around and saying, well, there's nothing else we can do. That nothing else we can do seems to be planned into the budget. That nothing else we can do seems to be not only planned, but then signed off on by you all when we turn around and give Paul Bockelman incredible reviews for the work that he's done, executing the same budget year after year. And so if we want to see different, we need to do different. I am incredibly proud of the community and teachers who went to Amherst College and asked them to do different and to invest their billions of dollars in endowment funds into our K-12 relationship in their shadow. I was ashamed you when have five I, we were told, I was ashamed when I, we were told that the town council couldn't negotiate with them because you couldn't do the work. Thank you for joining us, Alex. Leila Mushabak, please. Hi, my name is Leila Mshepek. I live in District 1, and I have two children in elementary school in Amherst. We are a town of educators and those who value how education enriches our society. My family moved to Amherst specifically for the Caminantes program at Fort River, not just for how it benefits my Palestinian Colombian children specifically, but also because it provides a structure that Spanish-speaking households can fully participate in, and so communicates a broader commitment on the part of this community to include marginalized groups in the public life of our town. I'd like to ask the council to consider what it will communicate if the town cannot find funds to support our schools when it did manage to find funds to send Amherst police to violently suppress peaceful student protest movements at UMass this year, resulting in the arrest of 130 Amherst students and townspeople, none of whom were convicted of a crime on public land our taxes also subsidized. It is in our community's interest to protect and safeguard our most vulnerable populations. As the town admirably stated in its renewed commitment to being a sanctuary community amid the repression we know will escalate under a Trump administration. I see fund allocation as directly connected to that commitment and I'd ask you to put your money where your mouth is. In this area of censorship, book banning, normalization of racist, transphobic, ableist, violence and rhetoric, even in our own backyards, it is more important than ever that we safeguard and support our educators and the families who are most at risk from cuts to vital school services. Thriving public schools aren't just important, they are a lifeline for many families. I urge you to put our money where our values lie. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Katie Dixon Gordon, please enter the room. Hello, can you hear me? We yeah. can. My name is Katie Dixon Gordon. I live in District 5 of Amherst. I have two children who are or will be in Crocker Farm, um, and some of them might be in the background right now. Um, I'm here to ask for the fiscal year 25 budget and future year's budgets to prioritize schools to um, increase the base in the operating budget um, and to include last year's additions as our base and to think creatively about other ways of providing support from schools, including from the operating budget or the capital expenditures budget where we can um, to help our students thrive, to make Amherst a premier destination, to show our priorities as a community and to en encourage people to continue to come here um, we're in a place where we will care about their children's education and, and continue increasing property values. I would like to also have Amherst consider diversifying its revenue sources and to engage in full-throated negotiations, uh, potentially with our nonprofit institutions, and to urgently pursue other creative sources to support our town um, and its needs. I appreciate the state level advocacy that you all are already doing to support our schools and our communities, but our children cannot wait for state level action um, and our, our community deserves um, a prioritizing of schools that matches our values. Thank you. Katie, thanks for joining us. Jill Brevik, please come up. Hello, my name is Jill Brevik. I'm in District 1. I'm the parent of two children um, in the Amherst Public Schools there at Fort River. 
I'm just here to voice my family's support for allocating as much money as possible to our schools this year and prioritizing our schools in next year's budget. Uh, strong and inclusive public schools benefit everyone. I am proud that our district offers the Caminantes program. So many families rely on this program. As you heard from Julian Ramirez and others, in plain and simple, without this program, fewer families would choice into the district and more families would choice out. When we first moved to Amherst, like many others have said tonight, um, we were excited that our children uh, would be in good schools and have this opportunity to join a program where they could gain language skills and uh, be in a diverse environment. But moreover, we were excited about what having a program like this signifies, what we thought it indicated about the values of this community as a whole. Now seeing regular controversy around continuing caminates and fights over funding other honestly baseline services like teachers, the arts, services for children with disabilities. We have been regularly disappointed. These things should be non-negotiable. Um, combined with the abysmal state of almost all of the school buildings, makes me wonder how things were even allowed to get as bad as they are. And seemingly, seemingly deep problems and nonstop turnover within the school administration, uh, not to mention incidents that have left us as parents of a non-binary child very unsettled. Our disappointment has just continued to grow. Um, funding education benefits the entire community without a doubt. At this point, I think many community members do not believe that our representatives agree with this statement. Please do a better job of showing us that you do. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Jill. Jennifer, please enter the room. State your full name and where you live. Hi, my name is Jennifer Curiali. I live on Woodlot Road in Amherst. Uh, I have a son in Fort River in fourth grade in the Comandantes program. And I'm here simply to echo what you have been hearing that our schools are in crisis. They are in decline. They are no longer competitive. I have neighbor after neighbor after neighbor choicing out of our school system. And that will continue if we don't do something uh, soon and, and something significant. I'm just asking you to prioritize our school as much as you possibly can in your budget decisions. Um, with the recent election, we are headed, I think, for very dark times. And it is not business as usual. It cannot be business as usual. We have to, the only thing that's really going to save us is education. And we have to, as a community, come together and support our schools. We need to get the schools to a place where our families want to stay and feel that the schools are meeting the needs of all of our students. So I just ask that you allocate as much as possible and do whatever is in your power to help our schools prioritize our children and keep families in the district using our public schools. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Jennifer. Vincent O'Connor, please come up. Um, Vince, I think you may have pushed the microphone button. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was profoundly disappointed that after the meeting of November 4th, that the town manager would open this meeting by another misstatement of the town's financial position. We are not a three to 4% community when for the past few years, we have been running $5 million uh, surpluses, surpluses that are not an accident, but coldly calculated misstatements of expected revenues and surpluses. So to remedy this, this multi-year misstatement, that have uh, adversely affected schools, I ask the council to do this. Direct the manager to include in his May 1st, 2025 budget, the full amounts voted by both the Amherst School Committee and the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Um, the problem, the council, I don't care what the council does with the full amounts of the, of the school committee budgets. I do care 
that a single unelected person can stand in the way of the council voting for the school budgets proposed by the elected school committees. The council, and, and there is just this, um, yes, the council can vote for the full, full budgets after the manager budget comes out if he cuts them. But in fact, that is an illusion because to vote for those full budgets, the council would need the time, not a month and a half, but would need the time to cut from the manager's budget in other areas so they could vote for the school budget. That is why both school budgets, full amounts, need to be in the manager's budget by direction, shall direction of the council with the clear implication Thank you for your that comments, if it isn't Vince. done, it will be in subordination by the manager. Ellen J.G., please enter the room. State your full name. Hello, I'm Ellen Jedrigadera. I am a resident of South Amherst and have two elementary age children at Crocker Farm. Um, it is a wonderful school and we love the staff and teachers there. And our family, like so many others um, that you've heard tonight, moved here in 2018 specifically because of the schools for our two kids. That is hands down why we came here. My husband went to high school here in the 80s and our nieces and nephews were here in the 2000s to present. And we knew Amherst was a town that valued education. We were told it was the best, one of the best in the state, and we thought it was. But what we are seeing over these past six, seven years is that our schools are in steep, serious decline. And one local professional we work with said to me, what is going on in Amherst at the school district? It's a sinking ship. This is the reputation that the town is gaining and has been since we moved here seven years ago. We've watched as cuts have been made again and again. And each year families and school employees are having to fight harder and higher, harder to keep the programs and staff that make our schools so wonderful. Special education, teachers and paras, the elementary orchestra program, the world languages program, in our own experience, um, what used to be the job of two speech pathologists at our elementary school has turned into the job of one. We've lost librarian para support in our elementary schools and our staff do more with less every year. They are overloaded. They deal with aging buildings, they deal with mold and our children are losing more each year and we can't afford to lose any more. So I implore you, <clears throat> excuse me, and sorry about the kids in the background. Um, I implore you as town councilors to please, please prioritize education in our town budget. Um, as others have asked, and thank you. Ellen, your time is up. Thank you for joining us. Allegra Clark, please come on up. Hi, my name is Allegra Clark. I am a resident of Amherst. I am a 2003 graduate of Amherst Regional Public High School, and I am also the co-chair of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, so I'm going to get that piece out first. Um, the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee is asking that the town council put forward support for all of the CSWG's recommendations from Part A and Part B specifically to include a youth empowerment center and a multicultural center. Um, in terms of the schools, I echo what many have said. My son is in second grade at one of the elementary schools and we have seen cuts after cuts in the three years that we've been involved in the district. Um, and I've been noticing that the cuts continually disproportionately affect our most marginalized students, students with special education services, students who were using the restorative justice programming in the high school and the middle school um, as alternative to punishment. And there are concerns about the impacts uh, to the Caminantes program, which serves many multilingual, multicultural families and does create a great sense of community. Um, 
there's concerns that there have been ILC positions cut or not filled. The high school Spanish language teacher won't be filled again after January. Special education services are being contracted out. The family center has been dispersed as well. Um, and there is concern where where's where's the money going to come from for those services? And I would ask that you include money from the surplus to our schools and fund as much as you can. Thanks for joining us, Allegra. Kyle Busaco, please enter the room. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first, thank you all for, for sitting here, listening to us all and doing this important and challenging work. Public office is um, not the most fun place to be in this politically fraught time. So I do respect and thank you for what you do. Um, I'm currently uh, a resident of District 2B. Um, much like many others, my family moved here during the pandemic um, due to the uh, reputation of the schools. We knew that Amherst had a reputation for being a vibrant hub for higher education. Um, and with those values having been predominantly trickled down to the K through 12 ecosystem as well. Um, it is very, very sad to know, not just here, but to know and feel that that reputation is now under extreme duress. Frankly, it's disappointing um, and exhausting that we, the citizens of Amherst now need, feel the need to beg for that reputation to continue. As a current business executive, I, I, I actually, I, I know that budgets are fraught with difficult and calculated decisions. I know this is not an easy job. I know it's not as easy as a swipe of a pen. Um, but I also know that budget decisions are a direct reflection of an organization's, or in this case, a town's values. Um, last year, my family came to beg for the music and special education programs not to be cut. Um, and here we are again. We're still begging for Amherst to uphold the bedrock of its history and culture, that of educational excellence. From a, a strict financial uh, perspective, this town is filled with young families, families who are supporting the very property tax income stream that is so heavily reply, uh, re, uh, relied upon. In order to make up that inflation to revenue gap, we have to ensure that Amherst remains a destination for young families, and it's a destination where they can trust that the education is still placed as an important value. Again, in politically fraught times like these, I ask, no, I beg, that you all prioritize giving the families of Amherst a sense of reliability, safety, and an educational system that is high among your values. Please prioritize funding our schools. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us, Kyle. Nina Mankin, please come on up. Nina Mankin, uh, District 1. I have a child at the middle school now, seventh grade. And first, um, I understand that there are factors in state funding that have impacted our ability to fund our schools. I understand that there are similarly changes in our demographics. And I thank you guys for struggling to uh, particularly work at the state level. Um, that said, I'm deeply concerned, particularly over the past five years and what I see as an erosion on the part of town leadership to fight for excellence in our schools as the last speaker uh, noted as a core community value. I felt that that was just reflected by the town manager in his presentation of our top concerns list in which the schools were not even listed as a concern. Um, our, I, I know how hard this is. I, I feel the fatigue in dealing with our crumbling buildings, with our complicated regional system and with our passionate citizenry. But please do not let that fatigue allow you to silo our complicated regional system. Um, please always allow our local and regional leadership at the head of the table in discussions about finances and needs and not relegate the schools to a waiting area. Please include them in all conversations about town budgets and certainly in allocations of any available town funds. Prioritize our schools in all conversations about allocations. Be open, proactive, creative, and above all, deeply committed to finding ways for our community to represent the height of excellence in public education and work with school, school administrators to collaborate on those solutions. So many of us have moved here for this. 
uh, please thank you for your continued stewardship and, and wisdom. Thanks for joining us, Nina. Lisa Belnafaz, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Lisa Pierce Boniface, the proud mother of Marisol Pierce Boniface, who spoke so articulately and much better than her mother could do after a day of work. But I will do my best to to tell you um, why I'm here to talk about why how important our students and our schools are to our community. I'm. I feel that the schools have done, especially the high school, has done a wonderful job with my daughter because she's had dedicated teachers, a plentiful group of creative artists in the performing arts programs and a robust athletic program. Um, all of that is because we have been dedicated educators for a long time and have created those programs. Uh, we moved here 18 years ago, and I worked with a strong coalition of parents and teachers to create the Caminantes program we have now, and I'm so proud of the fact that we are in its sixth year. I am now an ESL teacher at that program, and I work with the founding class, who are fifth graders, and I wish you could see them every day and see how they can speak in two languages and are just beautiful represent rep representatives of our town. Um, I hope that you all will consider that program as something super important in our town and that is bringing people into our town and will continue to have it after sixth grade. I also need to let you know that as a teacher in, in Fort River, we are stretched to the, to the hilt. Today, I had to substitute for a teacher who was out with their daughter um, who needed to go to a, doc a dentist appointment. We do not have the subs we need in our schools. So they're pulling from our teachers who have a regular schedule with students who have to go into the classroom. And we also do not have the staff we need in the library. The paras in the library are super important to our schools. I just want you to- we only have five seconds. Our programs and our, um, to our committed staff as stellar students. Thank you for joining us. Georgia Malcolm, please come up. Um, dear members of the Amherst Town Council, I'm writing to express my deep concern regarding the allocation of the Amherst's um, surplus and to urge you to consider investing, investing a significant portion of these funds into our public schools. Amherst has long prided itself on being progressive, inclusive, and socially just community. But the gap between these values and the current state of our public education system is widening. Amherst claims to embrace diversity and social justice, but these principles are not reflected in the actions taken with regard to our schools. As the student body becomes more diverse, the resources available to these students are shrinking. Class sizes are growing, teaching positions are being eliminated, and st crucial student supports are disappearing. These are not just numbers. They are children who need a chance to overcome the generational and systemic disadvantages they face. Equity is not just a buzzword. It is a commitment to providing resources where they're most needed. The most vulnerable students in our community, many of whom come from marginalized, and underrepresented backgrounds deserve the tools and support to succeed. But with every passing year, we see our schools decline. It is disheartening to witness how these students are left without the resources that would give them a fair shot at breaking the cycles of disadvantage. Some members of this town council are fortunate enough to have the financial means to send their children to private schools, an option that many of our public school families simply cannot afford. The question must be asked, why is this happening? Why are our public schools no longer seen as good enough? Research shows that when schools and neighborhoods become more diverse, they often lose resources. More affluent and predominantly white schools continue to receive greater investment. You only have another second. While the schools that serve our most valuable population are left to struggle. This is not just, I, I would really like, I'm, I'm the president of the union and I'm speaking on behalf we have negotiations coming up. And like um, Lisa said before, we're stretched thin. So I, I would like another 
15 seconds, please. Please go ahead. Research shows that when schools and neighborhoods become more diverse, they often lose resources. More affluent and predominantly white schools continue to receive greater investment, while the schools that serve the, our most vulnerable populations are left to struggle. This is not just disappointing. It is a reflection of the systemic inequities that pervade our society and that Amherst is sadly not immune to. Amherst, for all its talk of social justice, must reflect on whether its actions truly match its words. The current state of our public schools is a very contradiction to the values this town claims to uphold. Please I urge up. you to invest the surplus funds where they're most needed. In our schools, particular programs Please that support up. our most vulnerable students. Without this investment, we're failing to provide the children with the opportunities they deserve. Thank you for joining us. And I just, you know, I just have to say, I'm sorry. You know, someone mentioned about not keeping up with inflation. And I mean, I don't know what they expect the teachers and the parents to do. Please. 13% last year for medical, 13% and we get like a 2% raise. I mean, seriously, people are stressed How about the children are stressed in? We need to invest the money in schools. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. We do not demonstrate during council meetings. Thank you. Ethan Todras, Whitehall, Whitehill, please enter the room. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, um, uh, my name is Ethan Todras, Whitehill. I live on Dana Street in uh, District 3A in Amherst. Um, I just want to add my voice to the chorus of um, concerned parents asking you to prioritize our public schools. I have two children. Uh, elementary age in Crocker Farm, and as I look up towards the middle school and high school in particular, I'm I'm, I'm worried about what it's going to be like, what their experience is going to be like up there. Um, as uh, I, I moved to Amherst uh, just last year, but previously I lived in Shutesbury for almost ten years, and I attended um, the the sort of the regional school budget meetings there, and I saw firsthand uh, how this complicated system. Kind of just leaves everyone pointing fingers at each other and saying who's going to fund it who's going to step up you know and, and and just more focused on making sure everyone else is paying their fair share than uh than, than stepping up and supporting our students in the way that they deserve and so i know it's super complicated i know it's hard to, to, to prioritize uh, uh and, and and figure out how to better fund those schools in that program but i urge you all to dig deep and 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 and, and do everything you can um uh, to, to prioritize our school particularly the middle and, and, and high schools. Um, uh, specifically, I'd like you to in include the full amount reallocated to the regional schools as the base for calculating next year's increase and allocate as much money as possible to our schools, op prioritize operating budgets over surplus generation. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate all the difficult work you all do. Um, and, I, and I hope you will hear this plea from our, from our collective population and do things, start doing things a little differently um, and, and reverse the decline that everyone is highlighting. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Ethan. Deb Leonard, come on up. Good evening. Um, my name is Deb Leonard. I live in District 5. I'm a member of the Amherst School Committee and the Regional School Committee, but I speak on behalf of myself, and I do not represent any of the, any of the committees I sit on. Um, when I first joined the, the school committee, I went to several of these uh, association uh, meetings and one of the things that stuck in our heads as new members and I say ours and I just said I wasn't going to speak for any in my head is a statement that uh, your budget is your policy statement and so when I look at the uh, the surplus and the uh, allocations of the surplus it's it's neither going directly to savings nor um, being expended it's a it's an amalgam of both and none of them are, are um, none of those expenditures, at least the, the recommended ones by the town manager reflect the needs of the schools, as did none of the millions of dollars of previous surpluses for the many years I went back. So I'd like to read some statements from the, from the budget book, and I'm gonna run out of time, but I'm gonna start with 25. The FY25 budget rests on several key assumptions, the foremost being that residents desire the continuation of our current high level of services. This encompasses robust schools, comprehensive public safety, full operational water and sewer, and many of these other um, budgets represent, make the same kinds of statements. 
So either please write the schools into the financial guidelines or take the schools out of those statements. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Deb. Margaret Sawyer, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Please go ahead. Margaret, we can't hear you. You may have a microphone issue on your end. It looks like you're unmuted. Um, Lynn, I think maybe we should move to the next person and come back to Margaret. Thank you. Anybody else in the, in the town room? Do you want to move to the next person on Zoom? Yes. Amber Keno Martin, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. We do have one more person in the room. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Amber Keno Martin. Um, I live in District 2. Um, I have two children in the Amherst Public Schools. So I specifically have a child in Caminantes, and I do echo um, everyone who's has spoken support of Caminantes um, up to this point. It's a wonderful program. Um, my child is in third grade, has been there since kindergarten. Um, we are native Spanish speakers in my family, and he's really had the chance to um, learn and grow in two languages and to share that knowledge and that growth with his, um, his classmates. Um, it's a wonderful program, something I really value. Um, another thing I really value is our educators, um, and I think it's truly a shame um, that our, our last contract negotiations, um, we couldn't even offer our educators a decent um, cost of living increase, um, despite the fact that there was plenty of free cash um, that time around as well. And like many parents who've been here for a while, I've seen round after round of budget cuts to the schools, proposed budget cuts to the schools. Um, I was here to talk to you when we lost our paraeducators in the library. Um, and so I am, I'm here tonight again <laughs> to ask you to prioritize the school budgets. Um, I also would ask you to prioritize um, the regional and the high school budget, um, the high school and the middle school, um, allocate as much money as you can to the schools of this, um, this free cash, um, and also include the amount that was allocated to the regional schools this year in next year's um, calculations for the budget, for the base calculations. Um, I believe that when we are creating school budgets, we should start with how much money do we need to run the schools that our children deserve? And that's how much money we need for our budget. And it's not cutting it down, cutting it down every year to what we quote unquote think that we can afford as a community, because we know it's not what we can afford, it's what we choose to fund. And I know this town council is very often choosing to fund things besides the school, because if not, we wouldn't have all this free cash at the end of the year. Where was Amber. that money? When I'm, I'm almost finished. Where was that money when we were asking for the school budget for this year? Where was that free cash? Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Amber. Angelica Back. Bernal. Uh, good evening. My name is Angelica Bernal, District 2, and I'm here on behalf of the Special Education Parent Council, CPAC, to urge you, as many others have, to prioritize education in your budget allocations. Our schools are in crisis. We remain, yes, a growing community, but as you've heard from one person after another, our schools are in decline and decay. Our playgrounds are structurally inadequate, especially for our students with special needs. Our children, our staff and teachers are dealing with leaky roofs and mold. It's beyond an embarrassment. It's irresponsible. For students with special needs, the problems are even more dire. We are running many programs on less staff than in previous years. Students with wheelchairs do not have accessible playgrounds. Attrition is high for many of our special education staff, leading to a lack in the administration of critical services, such as, physical, such as speech therapy in the middle school this year. Movement rooms that provide critical services and therapies for our students remain inadequate with outdated equipment, such that many of us, many of us parents and teachers themselves have had to purchase equipment. The general perception is that our special education programs are of high quality, and I'm here to tell you that that's unfounded. There is this belief that programs are so great that students are somehow choosing in to, uh, to be in this district. But in fact, many of us, the reality on the ground is that we're choosing to place, we're looking to place our children out of district. 
Meanwhile, special education programs remain scapegoated time and again as the reason for rising costs. Our special education programming has long been in crisis and needs more, not less investments. For a town which we pay such high property taxes, this situation is appalling and many families are in flight. We are concerned even with the new public education uh, building that we're going to continue to be dealing with this. We are a community made strong by family and children, and we urge you to please prioritize this. Like many have said, these are our values, and I would be remiss as a political science professor not to say that given the current changes that are coming with the Trump administration, we are looking to you, our local officials, to be the bulwark of our democracy and to uphold a key democratic value, which is a high quality education. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please, thank you. Uh, Luke Conover, please enter the room. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, it has been uh, a number of years since I've had children in the system. Um, but I have to say that I hope that all of you who have children recognize the precious resource that our children are. Every society completely depends on the education and well-being of its children because they're the ones who come along after us and take care of things in, when we're too old to do it ourselves. That is the greatest resource we have. Now, I also recognize that the town will never have enough money to do everything that we want, especially in a town where so much of the, the property is not taxed, not available for taxation. But the point is that given that we don't have enough money to do everything, we have to set our priorities straight. Children are our greatest resource. Children need to be at the top of the list of priorities. As is often said, Education, the way we fund education is a reflection of the fact that children can't vote. If they could, I wonder what the town council would look like. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Arlie, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. We are going to end when we get to Margaret Sawyer. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Um, I was looking at the packet today and I saw your wonderful letters to the state about the funding um, issues unfair to our town and trying to remedy those. And But I was struck that the case being made is that though the population of the schools are declining, um, you know, we still need the funding. And it, again, just in hearing people talking about the budget and where we decide to put money, whether free or not, is the reflection of our values. I thought, well, isn't it interesting that the library uh, is making the case we need more space for children and teens. And again, I just wonder, the people who are planning, the, you're the planner of the town. You have one part of the town saying, uh, we have less children and we can put two elementary schools into one because of that. And then on the other hand, but we have to build this huge thing for more space for children and teens. It's, I don't understand the people responsible for planning, how you justify these things in your mind. Um, and for the parents and stuff, you know, the library's getting a lot of money. So we see some of the values of this town. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Issa Eslam. Please enter the room and not, please correct your name if I have mispronounced it. Hi, sorry, this is my son's Zoom account. Uh, my name is Rabia Ahmed and I am in District 2. I'm the proud parent of two Fort River Caminante students. 
one in second grade and one in fourth grade, and I want to express my strong support against any further budget cuts to our schools. Like many families have already said, we moved to Amherst because of its reputation for high quality primary and secondary public educations and because of the Caminantes program. We're a multilingual fa family, and while we don't speak Spanish at home, attending this program and being in this environment with others like them who speak another language at home, have family overseas, has been significant in helping them feel at home, especially during these polarized times. Programs like Caminantes also diversify the teachers in the Amherst Public Schools. My children have been taught by people who look like them and share similar life experiences. Nowhere else could I imagine they would have the experience that is truly transformative, truly representative of what Amherst claims to value in terms of diversity and social justice. We are losing students year after year to those who are choosing out of our district. Caminantes provides an incredible alternative to competitor dual language charter programs. Instead of cutting critical programs, we need to figure out how to expand programs that represent who we are as a community. I am left to wonder why in a town that prides itself on being home to three great universities, our primary schools are falling apart physically and have been for years. We've been promised a new elementary school. We've been hearing about it since before my children were born. The middle school has a roof that is crumbling. Yet we are expected to trust that this town will do what is right and prioritize what it values most and what happens inside the school, even though year after year, the only thing that remains constant is that the school budgets are continuing to be cut. As a community that prides itself truly on education, we seem to have forgotten about the youngest and most impressionable and vulnerable of, of our residents, many of whom are still overcoming challenges posed by COVID and living in a world filled with anxiety and stress. It's now to, it is now time to prioritize them. Do not take away from our children. Please stop deprioritizing our kids. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Ronnie Parker, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Um, hi, I'm uh, Ronnie Parker. I live in District 4. Um, I, I'm very distressed to hear about the struggles around our school budget. Um, I don't have any children in our school system. I probably won't in the future, but I feel compelled to speak because if there's one critical government service that we cannot let fall, it is our schools. All I've heard in the three years that I've been here about the schools is the budget cuts. And it doesn't, it's sort of unbelievable to me. Schools connect us in ways that no other institution does. They connect children, who speak different languages, come from different cultures, have different abilities to each other, and they do the same for the families. In my mind, schools are the foundation of community. And I don't, I really honestly don't understand why there are so many budget cuts. So I'm here to say, please, please, please give the schools their budget, give them the opportunity to perform as well as they can. And I mean the programs like Caminantes, but also the uh, educators themselves. Um, I had one other comment, but it was not about education. Should I do it now or wait till later? It should be for later, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, that's it. If it's for the FY25 budget, you do it now. No, it's not. Okay, thank you. I mean, oh. 26 budget, FY20. I'm sorry, it is, it is. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, I'm speaking now as the co-chair of the Human Rights Commission in that capacity. I spoke at this meeting last month and noted that I did not know our budget. Today, I'm here to say that I do now know our budget and it is zero. We proposed a three-pronged multi-year strategy of awareness raising, data gathering, and building accountability over a few years. But now we're called on additionally to remind and reiterate that every resident in Amherst, whether documented or not, has rights, human rights and rights under US law. We're working intensively to create materials and resources in multiple languages that will inform everyone about those rights. To succeed in reaching Amherst residents who need this information, we need funds. Our budget, ultimately reflect our values. That would be the case for education as others have pointed out, as well as for human rights. Let's not say that human rights is a zero for Amherst. I hope you will consider and appropriate our small budget request. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Sawyer, please 
enter the room. Okay, Margaret, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. You can hear me? Yes, we can, but please okay. speak to your mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it is wonderful to see you all again, and I am grateful that you all take our commentary and that you're working so hard. And also, it is true that this is becoming an annual, you know, every year we're doing this. Um, I wanted to point out that the the fact that we come back to this every year, that there's these huge fears about the budget and the budget is made in such a way that it becomes almost brinksmanship right until the very end and then um, money is found is felt every day among educators. People are constantly afraid that their jobs are going to be lost, that they should be looking someplace else. It's felt in the schools. And um, I just wanted to point that out, that it's not as if the school moves along peacefully while we all talk about the budget. And then at the last minute, everybody resolves to the budget, what, what, what it stands. Um, it actually, these conversations affect daily life too. I also am grateful that we conservatively budget. That's important to be conservative. But when one's conservative and then there's a surplus, that surplus needs to go back to funding those places that we were too conservative, right? If you're too conservative and you get a surplus, it needs to fill in those gaps. And I'm concerned that that isn't happening. Um, I think our town often wants too many things. We have too many desires. Um, I am personally really glad that the library budget came in as it did and that they're going to be able to build. But I was concerned all along that it's really hard to have something that is um, historical and perfectly, perfectly historical and perfectly green and affordable. And I'm concerned that sometimes we are striving for so many ideals that we're losing track of our goal. And I think our goal is the schools. Thank you for joining us, Margaret. Thank you. I want to note that over the time period that we've been in this public forum, we've had somewhere around 50 to 55 people in the Zoom room. Um, given that there's no other comments on this particular public forum, I'm going to uh, make a motion to, uh, I'm actually, I'm going to ask the Finance Committee to adjourn for the public, no. this public forum. No, they can stay convened for both. Okay, and, and we don't have to adjourn either. Please we do this public forum. This public forum is adjourned. Is there a second? second? Second. Thank you. Um, Pat DeAngelis is absent. Anna uh, Devlin Gothier. Aye. Uh, Councilor Ette. Aye. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Can, uh, Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Okay, this public forum is adjourned. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, and we will reconvene at 8 10. Thank you. At that point, you'll hold the public forum on the supplemental budget appropriations, and then the regular meeting will reconvene. Thank you. Please unmute, please mute your mics and your picture. Thank you.
please get ready to reconvene. Please turn your videos back on when you're returned. Thank you. Pam is back, Afraka is back, Jennifer is back. Okay, uh, I have to wait one more minute. Um, good evening. It's still November 18th, and we're now moving on to our next uh, public forum. This is the public forum on appropriations outside the budget. I want to just mention that the Finance Committee is already in session, and the Town Council uh, is being called to order for the purposes of this forum at 8.10. I am not going to go through all of what I've gone through before. I'm going to quickly state that, that this public forum is on the financial orders that were presented to us at the last meeting. They have since gone to the finance committee. And at before we can, before we adjourn the public forum, we will ask the finance committee to decide whether or not they stand with their existing votes uh, from the other day. So with that in mind, um, are there any public comments with regard to the financial orders? If you would like to speak and you're in the audience, make sure you have signed up with Athena. If you are in the Zoom room, please raise your hand now. This is regarding the financial orders for appropriations outside the budget. I see two people, Athena. Vince O'Connor, please come up. Um, did you want to do two or three minutes? Uh, I've, I'm going to stick to two minutes for the whole evening. Okay. At this point, we have just got too much else to do. Thank you. Thank you. So. Please proceed. Specifically, I'm here to speak about uh, asking the council not to place uh, any money in the 
capital reserve fund. Um, the other appropriations, I do not have an opinion on. It would seem to me that they're perfectly um, reasonable. The reason I ask you not to appropriate that money to the capital reserve fund is because the budget priorities that we have um, been visited have been visited upon the town are not only profoundly misogynist, they are disrespectful of children, their parents, and educators. Um, the money has gone, the surplus has been generated for a number of years. The money has gone to, uh, to departments supervised by the town manager and, and staffed primarily by men. We just had a public hearing and quite frankly, I'm sure that none of you, it did not escape a single council member's attention about who spoke to the school budget by gender. Please do not vote by a majority to put out of reach of the council, out of reach of the council majority, the, 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 the substantial amount of money that was included in the surplus that only one person last May really should have known about it and did not either tell this council, the public, the press, or the parents of this town instead said exactly the opposite. We don't have the money when anyone who is a town manager absolutely knew what revenue Vince, and, and your time is up. numbers would have been. Thank you. Deb Leonard, please come up. Hi, uh, Deb Leonard, District 5. I'm going to skip all the I do not speak for school committee stuff and just uh, speak to the uh, the recommended appropriations out of budget. I, I just want to point out that um, what I was trying to say earlier in the evening, not all of this surplus is going to savings and not all of it is being used for um, current items in the budget. It's, it's a mixture and I get whiplash. Uh, yes, we're saving. Yes, we have money. No, we don't. I, I also had the same issue with some of the, the numbers that I've been looking at too late, too early, 3.4%, 4.5%. I just would like some clarity. I understand these are complex issues. We're not asking, or I'm not asking for them to be entirely resolved, but um, there's got to be some space for some of the needs of the region to um, be met within this um, within this surplus. And I would point out, as I have, that there have been prior surpluses which haven't addressed the needs of the region as well. It just takes one of you all to vote to postpone these things. Um, these, these, the surplus, the free cash was certified very end of October. Um, the, the, the memo hit the packet November 1st, it's November 18th. I'm still not really sure what the rush is. Um, if there's a reason to vote these things before the end of the calendar year, I would like to know what that is. But um, it's a lot of money, and it can be used now for things that the region needs now. And um, again, not asking for all of it, but I'm asking you to, to consider, as you have in FinCom, rethinking some of these prior decisions. Thank you Thank for your you. comments. Um, there's no further comments at this point. Uh, I'm going to... Um, First of all, ask the Finance Committee if you would consult with your members. Well, yes, um, we do have to um, take up again our recommendation for uh, appropriation and transfer order FY2505C, which is $200,000 to purchase uh, sidewalk equipment. We got an update from the superintendent of public works 
saying that they could live with a $140,000 um, uh, purchase uh, appropriation. So I think the thing on the table now is whether we want to um, go ahead with what the 200,000, reduce it to 140,000 or just um, say no. <laughs> uh, those are the three choices we have right now. So um, if there's someone from the uh, Kathy, do you, you want to? Yeah, I might have missed an email, Bob, when you said they gave us an updated number. Did they also, um, there had been a statement that this equipment could be used for something other than plowing sidewalks. So implying in the spring, summer, or fall, could be used. Did they give us any sense of what other uses they would have for this uh, piece of equipment? The the from, from what I could get the, the the memo was a little confusing, but from what I can gather, um, the the machine that was two hundred thousand um, dollars has a universal quick hitch attra attachment system that could be used with a loader bucket, loading forks, auger system, grapple loading system. Sweeper broom, as well as straight snow plow, angled plow, and snow blower. So it can be used for various uh, purposes. Um, I don't know. They, they talked about, uh, he talked about um, the whacker and the tool cat, um, but doesn't say that they, what they can be used for other than plowing. Um, uh, uh, so yeah. the answer to number one currently has the MSB is the most expensive and designed for snow removal with limited other season usage. So they, the, the cheaper models it looks like they're only good for snow removal. They're not good for anything else. So that's. May I also mention that you have the opportunity to take this back to the finance committee. If you don't want to vote tonight, I I I think we need to discuss this more before we're, we're prepared to vote on it. You have two hands up. Uh, well, okay, uh, Councillor Haneke. Actually, Kathy, you still have your hand up. And then it, it was just stuck up while okay. I read the Councillor Haneke is a member of the Finance Committee. Yeah, um, I think the memo that I just saw in the packet now, when Bob mentioned it, um, indicates that the 200000 would pay for a tool cat that is on par with the whacker that we currently have, and that those uses that are mentioned in answer number one are the summer uses and the year-round uses, um, loading forks, loader buckets, auger systems, grapple loading systems, sweeper broom, that's that's not winter use right there. That's the rest of the uses we were asking questions for. Um, I believe his, at least pricing, it seems like the 140 would be the tool cat instead of the whacker, but it's a less powerful one with those same uses. Anna, at this point, I'm gonna to stick to finance committee people. I had a general process question about what was happening right okay. now. Okay, I thank you for asking that. Thank so you. the finance committee voted for four of the five financial orders at their meeting on Friday. They requested additional information on the sidewalk. And at that point, that information has been provided. And so during this meeting, since the finance committee is in session, they have the opportunity to decide if they're going to change their votes on anything else or vote for this. I understand. Um, my question is, if the Finance Committee chooses to take this back to the Finance Committee, should the rest of us consider it struck from the agenda? And if we had questions regarding this, should we then wait and send them to the Finance Committee chair or wait until it comes back? If the Finance Committee does not vote on this and takes it back to the Finance Committee, we'll take it off the agenda tonight. Great. And okay. we should send questions to Bob, assuming that they will be discussing it. Soon. Thank you. Uh, Andy, as a member of the Finance Committee. Yes. Uh, we have a meeting on Friday, I believe, and uh, it's still time, if it's not on the agenda, to add it back to the agenda. Um, I would suggest that we do that and come back on and ask the council to postpone action 
on this one order until December 2nd. I think that it is not a good use of the council time to have a committee meeting in the middle of a council meeting. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's her. And there's no other objections from the finance committee. Okay. I have uh, another, I'm sorry, I have another process question. Yes. So if this is something, so if, if when we discuss free cash um, and, and then request the supplemental budget appropriations from free cash, uh, if, if removing one of them may impact the decision of how the remainder of free cash is spent, should we be pulling all of them so that we can look at them as one big picture versus doing one at a time in this a way? Point of order. Lynn, right now we're in a public forum on these supplemental budget appropriations. Finance committee has remained convened so that they can either reaffirm or amend their vote on the appropriation orders. This discussion should um, wait until the regular council meeting resumes and these are up for discussion. Okay, at but if this point, impacts the rest of it, at this point, doesn't the, matter. The decision point is for finance committee to reaffirm or amend their um, recommendations on the orders, and mm -hmm. it sounds like they've chosen not to make a recommendation on this um, snowplow order. So but they're not amending it either. They're totally they're pulling it back. So it's the third so option it, is to so, pull it back. So the the, if the finance committee doesn't make a recommendation, then the the council can't act on it. Right. So it would come off the agenda. There's okay. no option for the council to act on it at this point. There is an option for the council to act on the other orders, and you can discuss that during the when the regular meeting reconvenes. So right now, Bob, you should okay, share thank you this portion of the meeting because it's a finance committee discussion on those appropriation orders. Yeah. Uh, Andy, do you have any comments? No, I think that Athena has uh, correctly pointed out a process question. Right. I think that the uh, question that uh, another counselor has asked is an appropriate question at later in the me in the actual meeting. And I think that uh, either the finance director or the town manager probably can answer that pretty quickly. Okay. Um, Councilor Haneke, you have your name up, hand up. I move to adjourn the special meeting of the finance committee. Thank you. I second that. You can't. You're, you're I not a member. I can't. I'm not a finance <laughs> committee member. Bob. Find a second, please. Bob should chair this part. I'll Bob, second. your chair. Uh, please find a second. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, count, we'll vote then. Is there, is there any other discussion? Uh, motions to adjourn are not discussable. Okay. Is Bernie is Bernie still with us? No, he's not. He's okay. All right. So I I will just go around uh, the the room. I vote aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Kathy? Yes. Uh, Alicia? Or yes. Council Walker? Sorry. Um, and Andy? Yes. Okay, so the vote is unanimous to adjourn. The Finance Committee. We're, okay, I move to adjourn the public forum on the supplemental budget appropriations. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to a vote on a Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Rete? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councilor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. And Pat DeAngelis is absent. Thank you. We're going to now go back to the regular town council meeting. And in light of the hour, I'm going to make some adjustments in the agenda. First of all, I'm going to dispense with announcements. <laughs> They're in your agenda. Second of all, when we get to item, I've already removed 6B from the agenda. I'm also now going to remove 8B from the agenda. And in both instances, ask that if you have comments, you forward them to me as soon as possible. And I'll remind you of that with an email in but the next 24 hours. Point okay. of information with one of them. Isn't one of them being automatically referred to GOL? So shouldn't all comments go to the GOL yeah. chair? 6B is automatically referred to GOL so that yes, the call comments should go to GOL. 
eight B is still in my hands, so please comments on that to me. Okay. Um, I want to just have one other consultation quickly, and that is, I know there was a serious desire to act on the proposal to establish the school zones. Is there still that urgency or can that wait till December 2nd? Could you uh, clarify who you're asking? Is it me? Are you asking me? Actually a TSO. That's I what am. I thought. So I wasn't sure if you're asking sponsors or TSO. I know we wanted to do it as fast as we can. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it on. Let's just see where we are, okay? Okay, um, so I'm going to add, also add, if you will, the council orders to the consent agenda. Okay, is there any objection to that? So council orders? Financial, the financial council orders. Yes, I object to that. Okay, then we will do them individually. All right, so we um, need to do public comment for this regular council meeting. Are there any people who would like to make public comment with relationship to this regular council meeting? I have one. Yes. Fence O'Connor. Okay. And uh, there is one in the audience. We're confining to two minutes because that's what we've used all evening. Thank you, Vince O'Connor. Um, 175 Summer Street, apartment 12. Um, I, I'm actually coming forward to make the statement I made that I plan to make on November 4th until I heard the financial discussion. But it is also financial. Um, I just want to say to the council, a, a reduction in the expenses for the library of two to $3 million that results in a bid of $7 million less by a previous bidder is an invitation to disaster in terms of change order. In fact, the chair of the library trustees himself in public have said, oh, we'll take care of all this with change orders. That's really an abuse of the bidding process. It creates a dangerous situation whereby if the anticipated by various things, five to $10 million in change orders comes to this council, you will then have a you'd be faced with a choice of either buttonholing the project and leaving it sitting there half done or having have your arm twisted to vote a, a bunch of change orders and pay for a bunch of change orders that you knew beforehand were anticipated and were going to put you way over the amount of money that you did. Please make it clear to whoever is responsible for letting this project go forward that that is not a good choice that the that this town should be faced with. And it will be faced with if this project goes forward. Thank you for your comment. Jeremy Anderson, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Yeah, hi, uh, Jeremy Anderson, 34 High Point Drive in Amherst. I, I know it's late, I'll be quick. Just wanted to thank the council for bringing up the school zone motion for the high school and the middle school. I thank TSO for the incredible work they did and, and as well as the superintendent of public works, uh, the engineer, town engineer. And really this is a, a great way that we can start making our, our community safer and addressing some of the pressing needs for our schools. So thank you all for staying late and for bringing this up tonight. Thank you for your comments. We're gonna to move to, let me just make sure. I'm, we have no hearings tonight. We're going to move to the consent agenda. The following items were selected because they were seem to be routine. 
listen carefully because I've removed some items from the printed set of motions. Um, if you want to remove an item, please say so after I go through the first list, and then that does not require a second. Uh, to move the following items into the printed motions that are under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of proclamation recognizing Small Business Saturday and Shop Local Week 2024. 8A, request to legislators to refile home rule petition H677, an act relative to, implement, to the implementation of the charter for the town, city known as the Town of Amherst, H3734, an act establishing a real estate transfer fee upon the transfer of property in the city known as the Town of Amherst, and H3840, an act authorizing extending local voting rights for lawful, per, lawful permit residents residing in the city known as the Town of Amherst. Um, 9A, one to two approval of board manager appointments for the Board of License Commissioners, Amanda Robertson for a term to expire June 30th, 2027, and Kurt Sunday for a term to expire June 30th, 2026, Cultural Council Du Kim for a term to expire June 30th, 2026, and approval of minutes September 28th, 2024, special meeting Minutes for Towns Meeting, October 7th, 2024, Regular Meeting Minutes, October 21st, 2024, Regular Meeting Minutes. Are there any quite requests for removal? Was that a motion? That was a motion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Seeing no hands, I'm going to move to a vote. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Angel DeAngelis is absent. Uh, Anna Devlin got there. Aye. That's unanimous. Um, I'm going to ask town, uh, Councilor Rooney to read the last portion of the Small Business Saturday and Shop Local. You do not have it. Thank you. We're going to dispense with the reading of that. Thank you. We're going to move on to um, presentations and discussions. And this is the financial planning for the four major capital projects. And I'm going to refer to town manager, Paul Bachman and finance, finance director, Melissa Zadwatsky. Thank you, Lynn. And we have a presentation for you. This is a um, project that Melissa took on when she started here just a few months ago and has been working on it and just a lot of credit to her for moving this forward. Um, you can go to the next slide when you're ready. I assume these slides will go into our packet at this time. Yes. yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So this presentation is in response to the council's goal of, of establishing, making progress on the major capital investments uh, consistent with the council's votes. And we talk about the elementary school building, the Jones Library building, uh, the uh, Central Fire EMS Station and the Department of Public Works. Um, and so we're going to talk about each one of those things. We're going to go to the next slide. And we'll try to be efficient for you because I know you've been here a long time already. So what we will do in this presentation, explain the planning model, outline the changing economic conditions over the past year and why we're presenting what we're presenting update our current modeling options, and then share next steps and some actual recommendations, including locations and um, sort of a financing model with you. I don't expect you to act on anything tonight, but I, we do have a request to you to act in the very near future. Next slide. So, and this is where we'll go fast. So the elementary school, we all are aware, we went out to bid, we received three bids, all were under our target budget. 
Uh, those three bids have been all have been challenged. So at least two of them have been, and that process is with the attorney general, who is well aware of our need to expedite this process. We've heard from them today, but they have not given us a. Our, our attorney reached out to them to ask them for an estimate of when they would render a decision. And they said they did not know. So um, this is uh, important for us to move forward. Uh, so the funding sources are in place with the debt exclusion, the MSBA grant and, and the capital stabilization fund. So that, that project is moving forward. And quite frankly, this does not actually impact us because it's debt excluded. It doesn't impact what we're gonna to present to you tonight. Okay, Jones Library, we received two bids. One was under our budget. Um, that that um, bid is being reviewed in light of other permitting things that we need in order to ensure that we receive the funding for the, pro for the project. Um, as you know, we've got $15.8 million from the town that's been allocated. Uh, there's an MBLC grant and other funding, including CPA money, which is also town funds and state and federals. But this project is not awarded yet, but it's at the award stage. So it could, once we're ready to um, make sure everything is in line and, the, and everything is, is established, that project could move forward. So that's, that project was, is carried in our model at $15.8 million. Um, the next is the, um, the fire EMS station. And we say fire EMS for real, very purposely because it is, most of our calls that come into the fire department are really emergency medical services calls. So we have to build a facility that accommodates both fire engines, fire equipment, plus EMS services like ambulances. We have talked with you previously and are recommending the preferred location being Hickory Ridge, which is a piece of land in South Amherst that the town purchased. There is buildable uh, space at the front on uh, West Pomeroy that can accommodate this facility. Um, what we would like to do with this project to move it forward is to update the feasibility study um, and to uh, move it forward into design and engineering. The reason this is important is that we control the site and because we own it, uh, there is no procurement for a location or anything like that. So as we look at this, I'm looking at the, the path of least resistance, in fact. So having site control is an important piece of that. It's also a very good location because it does serve uh, South Amherst well. And also, if you think about it, most, most of our calls are ambulance calls. Most of those calls go to Coley Dickinson Hospital. Um, and half of the ride time for those calls is going to the hospital or coming back from the hospital to the station. There, it's easier to get the, to this location because they can cut through Bay Road. They don't have to stay on Route 9 or Rocky Hill Road to get back to the station. So. There's some advantages to this. And when we did the heat analysis, which, which identified where the um, calls were coming from, it's within the range of the heat analysis in terms of response time. And the next one is the uh, public works facility. Um, this also is in dire need of a uh, new building. And uh, what we are recommending and that the proposal is that our preferred location is to utilize the existing site and on South Pleasant Street, this goes along with the same um, strategy of site control. We don't have to go out and find sites. We have done extensive work on identifying sites. We've shown you some of the options in the past. Um, we've done due diligence on some of the sites um, and none of them have really proved uh, to be um, sustainable in, through our process. We've done an RFP for sites. It's just very challenging. And many of you have actually said, why don't we just keep it where it is? And the reason we don't keep it totally where it is is because the site that it's located on is a, an excellent site, but it's not very big. So the strategy would be to have multiple sites. Uh, our original goal of walking into this is to have one site where the entire DPW uh, workforce could be gathered in one location um, because there are a lot of efficiencies of that, of scale and also management for doing that. This, um, so we're gonna sacrifice that in order to move this project forward because the building is in such dire need. We will use Ruxton, which is a site of a piece of land that the town owns and utilizes by the DPW off of Pulpit Hill Road currently for as an auxiliary site 
so to use for um, storage, which is what we use it for now, um, to use it for lay down space. And um, I didn't realize a lot of people don't know what lay down space is. Lay down space is when you are going to do a water sewer project, you order a bunch of pipes, but you're not gonna need it for two months, but it gets delivered. You need a place to put the stuff. And so there's a lot of land area where you can put stuff. Um, we would also look to put um, equipment up there that isn't in immediate use. Like uh, in the winter, we would use put summer equipment up there. In the summer, we would put winter equipment up there that's not on a daily basis being uh, trucked in and out of the space. We would also uh, utilize a space at the Atkins Treatment Facility and the Wastewater Treatment Facility for the people who work at those um, at those in those areas. Right now, uh, water works out of the current DPW, so we, we would disperse some of our staff. Uh, we would also continue to utilize the site at the region at, that's adjacent to the regional high school for our tree and grounds department. Um, so we will have multiple locations, multiple smaller locations instead of one larger location. Um, so the next steps for this is again to utilize um, establish a building committee and to start with the design and engineering. Next slide. So were you going to do this one? I was. Okay. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm just going to lay out some of the assumptions we've made um, for constructing these models um, and um, a financing plan going forward. So um, first, We'll talk about the elementary school. As you all know, this is a $99 million project. Um, it is um, subsidized by a, a couple of subsidized. It, it has matching funds from um, MSBA grant uh, for a good portion of the project. And the council um, approved a transfer of $5 million of reserve fund to help mitigate the um, excluded debt, which is the primary source of paying for the town share of this property. So for the um, for the purpose of looking at this uh, long-term plan, this um, project falls outside of our um, capital allocation of tax, um, of the tax levy. So um, it's important to acknowledge it because it is a um, taxpayer project, but um, for the purpose of planning within the um, percentage of the tax levy that we're going to go forward with the other three projects, we um, it doesn't it doesn't impact that directly. Um, secondly, the uh, Jones Library uh, project uh, is a forty six million dollar project. The town share has been set at uh, $15.8 million. Um, it is, has matching funds from the um, Massachusetts Library Board, and, the, um, and then they have a significant amount of um, private fundraising and other grants um, matched by the trustees. So that, for this project, we are only considering for inside the capital allocation of Levy the fifteen point eight million. The rest of the project is funded from other sources outside of that. The DPW uh, facility, um, as Paul mentioned, we're looking at a phased approach for this. Um, we've currently are looking at a budget of thirty five million for the total project. Um, this is a smaller budget than what um, the DPW had previously looked at to have all of the. DPW facility at one site. Um, we are hopeful that um, with some of the modeling that has been done that this is reasonable. I, I can't say if it is or it's not. We really need to, to look at it because the site, the um, feasibility studies that were done for DPW were done um, at other locations. Um, the fire station, uh, we've put a budget in for that of $30 million. Um, as Paul mentioned, we're looking at the Hickory Ridge site, which would mean that we um, do not need to uh, procure a site, which is nice, nor do we have to manage um, swing space like we do with the DPW site because that can be built and um, stand up. The $30 million um, budget is based on, um, there's a recent comparable in um, Williamstown where they built a, um, 
net zero uh, fire station for uh, $22.5 million. So we thought that that was a good car comparable. However, that fire station does not have emergency medical service. So we needed to add something on ours to sort of hope that that could fit within the model. I think Paul mentioned earlier that we recognize that these budgets may not meet all the needs or wants of these departments, but we thought that this was a good place to start and this was the amount that quite honestly I could make work. <laughs> so um, moving on. Um, so a big part of this process um, has been going on for many years um, and is based on um, establishing a capital stabilization reserve and um, maintaining that reserve to draw down over a number of years to um, fund these projects with um, as minimal impact to the operating budget as possible. So um, you established the capitalization, uh, sta the capital stabilization reserve balance in 2023 at um, $9 million. Um, in that same year, we did remove um, $5 million to put towards one of the other projects, um, but that money has been taken out of capital reserve and is sitting with the project for the school building, um, elementary school building. Then um, we added some more um, reserves in 2024, and right now before you um, is another request to add more to the capital stabilization reserve of 3.9 million, which um, is waiting for um, council approval. If that um, transfer should be approved, the balance in the capital stabilization would be $11.6 million. And this is important because um, these numbers are used to um, present, are presented in the model. Um, next slide, I guess. So, um, Again, the assumptions, uh, $30 million for the fire EMS station, $35 million for the public work facilities, um, $15.8 million for the library. I used 20-year um, debt for the library um, because it was a smaller dollar amount and it could be um, shortened in its length. Um, it has a slow, slightly lower interest rate of 4% and the, um, the other two projects I've put on 30 year um, debt um, to help um, stretch out the um, impact on our budget. And they have a slightly higher interest rate of four and a half percent that was recently updated and provided to me from our financial advisors at Unibank who help us with our bonding. I created um, four models for us to consider. Um, the first is um, a decrease in capital. Um, we currently are at 10.5% of the um, levy in the operating budget for capital spending. This would decrease it to just 10%. Um, all of the assumptions are, I should say in the beginning, all of the assumptions assume that we have continued capital beyond the borrowing for these projects um, and the already issued debt that we are obligated to pay um, an additional $3 million a year for our ongoing um, capital needs in, such as new vehicles, fire trucks, repairs to buildings, roofs, et cetera. Um, so the first is to decrease the capital allocation. Um, that would re, um, use $15.5 million of our reserves, which is slightly more than we have available right now in the capital stabilization. Regular stabilization is there, um, but you know it's more than we have in the reserves. So the second um, option is uh, completely identical to the first option. It just leaves the capital percentage of the levy funding at 10.5%. It um, has um, it has an eleven million point two use of the reserves over the um, over the course of the project to maintain our capital funding within the um, set aside percentage of the levy. The third option is a delayed start. 
So I should say that in this option, when we look at the um, modeling, that the delayed start um, has the, the DPW and fire station projects starting two years later than all the other um, projects. And so for that, I have built in um, a escalator for cost of 5% a year for both of those projects. And the fourth uh, option- Point of order, sorry to interrupt you. Can we get the, the translation or whatever moved up so we can see that fourth option? <laughs> yep, sorry. <laughs> Um, so the um, fourth option is the large cash option. And um, honestly, I put this one in there because in the original um, presentations that I was reviewing from Sean Mangano, there was a, an all cash option for the fire station. So this would be to um, fund cash of $20 million towards the fire station and only borrow the 10 million um, and maintaining the... Uh, $3 million a year of ongoing capital and the 10.5% of levy. Um, and it, of course, uh, uses the most cash because that's the option. Um, so uh, I guess the next slide. Okay, so I need my notes. So looking at this first model, um, the existing debt is uh, the green. Um, and so that's any existing debt we currently have or something that's authorized that we are probably going to borrow for in the future that, um, you know, might come on in the next year or two, might not be in this year, but we've already authorized it. We're already in process of procuring those items. The um, red is for the fire um, EMS stations. The gray it, um, is the 35 million for the DPW facilities. The purple is the library and the um, orange polka dots are um, ongoing capital of 3 million a year. So again, this takes you know $15.5 million of um, our capital reserves. Oh, and the black line kind of below zero there is where we're pulling the amount out of capital stabilization to maintain the um, capital investment from the levy to under the 10% um, in this case, because this is the lower um, tax levy allocation option. And so the black line as it rises is our tax levy going up with two and a half in new growth. And then the, um, the amounts of the yellow over the top or the orange that is the ongoing capital that needs to be subsidized directly from the um, the the cap the capital um, the cap capital stabilization fund will bring that so that we're only using the that ten percent of the levy in this model. So all of these um, diagrams are the same in that way, um, but this is the option where we reduce the percentage of the levy. Um, I, and then the second model is um, the maintaining the same um, capital um, allocation of 10.5. And um, you can see again that we're going to use um, the, um, the capital stabilization to draw down against it to keep um, our allocation of capital in the budget under that amount um, for, I believe it, it, it works out to, the line gets really low in the outgoing years, but it's usually between eight and 12 years for all of these models that we would have to continue to draw down on the capital stabilization. And so in the third model, this model um, is a delay um, in the projects. And so this is much easier to fit into the model as our um, tax revenue grows. However, I believe that there are significant risks with this model because of the increase in cost and um, the unknowns of, um, honestly, I don't know what interest rates are gonna do in two years, never mind five or six. So, um, you know, it's an unknown. And then also, 
we have to recognize that both of these buildings are in severe disrepair. And so any emergency that might come up between now and the time that we get going on their new projects would have to be funded from somewhere. And so, you know, where, where does that, where do those funds come from? And in the fourth model, um, this is the uh, cash option. It, um, it's obviously the easiest to do um, for um, the debt, um, but it is, um, and, it, and it is honestly the least expensive. It is the one that makes me the most nervous um, because I believe that the amount of flexibility we have in doing this is very low and um, we wouldn't be able to respond to a, um, an emergency if it happened. But if circumstances change and we all of, us all, all of a sudden found ourselves with an extra $20 million laying around, then you know maybe this is an option. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, the things to consider are, of course, the urgency of the projects and to move forward quickly because of rising costs and the continued ma maintenance of our current infrastructure and the unknowns of interest rates. Um, the other uh, major thing to consider is the capital um, that we've, um, we need to, our, our capital reserve was, was set aside for this project, so we should move forward with doing these projects with that money, if that, if that was the purpose of them, and that we need to maintain our reserves so that in the event that there's an, an anticipated expense or um, loss of revenue, we can still um, react to that. Um, you know, um, then we just need to make a balance between our operating and capital. And um, in these models, we're trying to lay out to maintain our current um, spending split for capital and operating at that 10 and a half percent, which is, you know, honestly what I'm hoping for. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, to allow us some more flexibility to adapt to economic changes. And we just need to recognize um, that these are estimates and um, there are lots of variables that could come up as we dig into the um, feasibilities of these projects and our budgets. So again, this is the comparison. Um, I'm gonna say that um, that, you know, uh, the urgency is really important, I think. Um, and so um, that's why three of the models have us moving forward as quickly as possible. I think that the um, impact of the high um, use of reserves is, would ne negatively impact our bond rating and put us um, in a position where we would be less flexible to um, navigate a change if it to come up. Um, you can see that the capital, um, other capital spending is even and that, you know, obviously the cost um, goes down um, with how fast you do the project and, um, and how much cash you can put into it. So, um, I would say that um, that I would, given those four models, if I was to make a recommendation that you know model two is the preferred model from my opinion, I guess, and um, because it gives us the most flexibility as the um, fits in with our plan and um, doesn't it doesn't put us at risk for um, the delay in services or big um, re reductions in um, our reserves. Um, and so the next steps is that we need to consider these four models, um, how much we wanna commit to our ongoing capital as a percentage of the levy. And if we are, um, if, if we're gonna accept this, if we're gonna establish the sites and um, establish those building committees to move forward. Okay, 
Paul, anything? So, yeah, just to note that we're in order to move this forward, the last bullet and the what we're hoping for the council to do, and I know, again, not looking for a decision tonight, but that you have it on your agenda to discuss in an active way. So we have talked about locations in the past to see if you're comfortable with those locations that we get the commitment from the council that, yes, these are the two locations or the approach to locations that we want. And then, you know, after I assume it is there to be a conversation at finance committee or here that we go through the financing plan, you have different four different models that you settle on a financing plan. So we can start making decisions along those lines as well in terms of the financial guidelines. Okay. So I'd like to start with clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy. What kind of questions should you say? Clarifying. In other words, do you have questions where you don't understand what was presented? Uh, I understand what was presented, but I don't understand the numbers underneath them. So can I ask those Please. questions? Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, the Jones Library assumption. Um, you're financing just $15.8 If we also have to go out for $46 million and we're short $7 million when we do that, we had some estimates a year ago on what short-term financing would cost us over the first couple of years. Do you have that in your model? There is, there's, there's no accommodation for anything except the 15.8 in this model. Okay, so the muddling, so I would recommend you do something to adjust. We, we had a line for short-term bans that was on the low side, but I don't know how best to do that, but it doesn't look like we'll start with all the money committed and so we'll we'll have more than just the 15.8 for our share so that's just that's just a question on that line so i'll go for my second question from sure. dpw i i like this i should start with terrific mm -hmm. and i think the decisions you're asking for make sense so on the dpw does your rough estimate for total include the fact that you are going to have to phase it because you're building on site. And what we heard as a description of that, um, what a few months ago is temporary headquarters for staff while you're knocking down building. Does that 35 include that? It, it tries to. Um, it, it tries to, but again, I'm not right. an architect or someone. No, sure. I'm just saying that you think the building might be 30 and you've got another 5 million or something that you've uh, jiggered with. Uh, yeah, phased. so what they, um, what the numbers I did see were for a much larger facility, and then they had some um, smaller, you know, minimum needs um, numbers um, that were between 28 and 18. However, they were for a completely different site. So, I mean, they're just, they're just not concrete enough to go on, but it, made me feel like in a perfect world, you know. Um, so um, is it enough to do the um, the staging? I don't know, but I mean, that's really why we need to dig into. And part of this was a designing around what was possible um, given the constraints of our budget. Um, th that's fine. And I, I just wanted to ask that because I think um, it, it will involve more than the cost of construction and it and the best way to get into it is quick feasibility on are we knocking the whole building down and rebuilding on the site or or what are we doing so yeah so and, i think the plan is to knock the whole building down and rebuild on the site um but there will be permanent temporary uh permanent storage space at the ruxton site and maybe some additional um disbursement of staff to their specialty areas such as the water and wastewater treatment plant okay so then I'll, I'll go to fire station then i have one final one so fire do they need all the property developable property mm -hmm. on that site and mm -hmm. if they don't um could we develop it sell it do something that would help finance that so i i don't i and it, you don't have to answer right now so they need x acres and we've got we've been told six or seven um so i don't know the specifics of the acres my understanding is that it's the frontage that the um, fire station would be placed on and um 
Um, I also understand that they're um, the backside of the um, Hickory Ridge is being used by the planning the conservation and stuff, right? So, so we did do a fit test to see if the fire station could fit there, and there would be other additional property that could be developed. However, the town chose to to do it. Okay. So, yeah. The, the exist the, the estimate for a fire station has always been thir uh, three acres. How many acres? Three. Three. So, so about half of what we've been told mm -hmm. were the front acres mm -hmm. that were developable. Yeah. So about okay. Um, then my last question is on the reserves that we can draw and. In addition to the capital stabilization fund, we have a general stabilization fund. Yeah. And at one point, when your predecessor was trying to show where we had at least some wiggle room, we said, could we live with less than 10% in general stabilization fund? And the answer was yes, but not less than X. So can at some point, can we be talking about we've got another 10 million in that yeah, fund? So so there is 10 million in that fund, well, 9.9 yeah. um, currently. And um, and so, yeah, for some of these models, we could dip into that. Um, so the structure that I, you know, walked into when we came in here is that we were trying to keep that 10%. Um, I, I mean, certainly it could be used temporarily and then maybe build back up over time, but, the, the uh, impact of that is that you um, reduce um, your bond rating because you're not as secure um, for an emergency. So that's why um, with the, the heavily, heavily use of the reserve one, that's the one that makes me the most nervous. The one um, where we use a portion of that um, regular stabilization, you know, maybe we go down a year or two and then we're able to bring it back over the course of you know us fitting these projects in so i i think i'll turn it over to others but i just want to say that with that modeling and when you mentioned the williamstown one williams put five million dollars into their fire station so when you said it would be nice to have a bit more money we thinking in terms of some of what we're doing in guidelines, I, I'm a big a big ask on some of this might make some sense. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Andy. Yeah, hi. I, first of all, thank you for the presentation and for the work you did to create it. Uh, but uh, one question that I had was, uh, uh, we had the regional schools, when they asked for capital um, contribution from the member communities, um, our contribution comes out of the ten and a half percent, and in recent, it, it's as recent as a year ago, there were fairly substantial uh, projections of need for the regional schools for its capital, and uh, I was wondering if you had uh, factored that into your thinking at all. So it it's in there. Um... It's in our our projections, like we always have the number from them, and so um, it's it would be um, included in the ten percent. So if they're going to go up substantially on that, then we'd have to fit, we'd have to fit it in our three million dollars additional capital. But I also think that it's um, part of their um, regular appropriation to us. Like they just sort of tell us what they what they need. I, I don't. It's not factored in here any differently than any outstanding debt that we currently have an obligation for. So if they don't have an open obligation for it and they haven't told us about it, it's not in here. So if they were to tell us tomorrow they need $10 million, we would have to adjust. Andy, further questions? No, I think I'll save it for the Finance Committee. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Councilor Haneke. So two. Um, on top of Andy's question regarding outstanding debt, is it correct to say that that outstanding debt line is only anything that's already been obligated, not estimated outstanding debt, and that all estimated debt needs to fit into the three million column, such that if we had to buy a fire truck again for one and a half million dollars, that that debt would come out of the three million or the estimated 
um, region debt service or assessment for their debt service, which is estimated in the next two years so, in our current capital budgets to go up to 800,000, that so that there, additional 400 comes out of the 3 million. So the estimated debt on already authorized but on issued debt that we are currently using is in here. Um, but it, there wasn't a lot of it, you know, most of it, I mean, because most of our authorized and issued debt is not in the general fund. And of course, these are just general fund projects. So um, the um, so it is in there. But if if like I like I said, with you know, if if we were to find out tomorrow that we need some emergency large project that is part of that 10%, it would change these numbers. It would have to come out of that three million. But if we have already authorized it, the modeling that was done, and I can't take credit for it before I got here, included estimated debt for stuff that we haven't yet borrowed for, but we know is coming. So I guess I'm getting confused between haven't yet borrowed for, but know is coming. Is that unauthorized that we know is coming, AKA region stuff or future ambulances no, or authorized. things like that. So it has to be authorized, authorized to be this model correct. outside authorized. of the 3 million. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the auxiliary improvements that would be going to um, the water treatment facility and the sewer treatment facility, are those estimated within this or are those intended to be paid for out of um, water and sewer fees? I believe they were. Um, so I was hoping that it would be in the uh, 35 million and um, temporary space. It was more of a temporary fix rather than a full time fix, you know, those improvements. So that's supposed to be, but any, like, it, it was, they would, we would, in, we need to accommodate people. And there are some water people at the, the DPW um, building right now. So, so one of the challenges of a multiple site is that it's more expensive in some ways because you have to have the same kind of locker facilities and things like that at, at multiple sites. And so this is not a great model for us to move forward, but given the difficulty of identifying a site that accommodates all of DPW. So, and then the other challenge we have quite honestly is that we backed in, in a way backed into these numbers. So like, what could we afford? So many times we start uh, projects and say, what do we want? And we sort of build a model around what we want, and then we find out that we can't afford what we want, and that becomes much more challenging. So we were what we wanted to do on these two projects is to say we have a budget for what we can afford to buy, and that's how we're going to move forward on these things. So can I ask why water and sewer funds would not be used as they, a portion of debt for paying for DPW or any improvements that relate to water and sewer uses since the, the enterprise funds should yeah, they, okay. they certainly they certainly could, um, and um, I mean, there's a lot of water and sewer debt that we, we anticipate coming pretty in the very near future. So it's going to be a balancing act for the council in terms of setting your water and sewer rates to support whatever we put onto that debt. But there's and, we don't have a, a firm answer for that. Is really the answer. Anything else, Councilor Haneke? All right, um, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood the the three million per year in, in other capital funds. Is that number all debt, or is that simply the 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 rest of the money, the remainder of the money that we have available for every other capital request e for those ten years? Either either or. So it would be either new debt that we don't know about today. So, um, or it would be cash capital um, to purchase a cruiser, uh, something like that. And so I would say that in order to, um, you may find that in those years, because that is a small amount of cash capital for the town. And, you know, Holly did look at me kind of funny when I had said three, but that was all I could fit, mm -hmm. that we maybe borrow for things that we've never borrowed before in order to sort of get us through those really challenging years. Um, it's an option. It, because it's not built yeah. into the model. It's just, I'm just saying, we have to yeah. think about how we do this without harming ourselves. Because in comparison, we would typically look at 10.5% for capital needs. And, and so this is a dramatic reduction in that. Well, so this is the 10.5. 
built into mostly debt mm -hmm. and then leaving a little bit for for changes. Right. Yeah. Right. So a um, couple of things. And again, thank you for this presentation. Very helpful. Um, I just want to make a, a, a comment about Hickory Ridge. So Hickory Ridge was purchased a number of years ago. It was um, uh, people were solicited for ideas for a master plan. And I it it's just feels a little ironic. It's not, I'm saying not that it's a bad idea, but it's a little ironic that we still don't really have a master plan yet we're citing a facility there. And I had hoped to see at least some options of <clears throat> this is the acreage that we feel we could, you know, sell or develop for housing. This is the acreage that might be appropriate for a central facility like fire station. Um, so again, we're sort of backing into this thing completely. Um, that said, uh, it well, that's that's my general comment about the master plan. Um, uh, I I am not opposed to having some of the DPW facilities uh, distributed. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. It's not obviously optimum, but it certainly makes sense, and I think it presents us with a with a more realistic cost for everything overall in that approach. So thank you. Jennifer? Yes. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. I, I even, I think I followed it. I am <laughs> oh, not an economist, so I appreciate that. So I have really basic questions. Um, at the last meet, council meeting, um, it was said that we wanted, the plan was to pay for DPW building in cash? No. Or the fire station, one of them. Right. Fire yeah. station. So the fire station, um, in one of the previous modelings that was done, um, the fire station was to be paid for in cash. And at that time, that fire station was estimated at $20 million. So that's why I presented the fourth option with a $20 million cash and then $10 million of financing, because I was trying to keep that comparable um, for the group. Um, then you had uh, talked about the phased approach. Does that um, also, is that the same as starting the fire station and DPW two years after the other two capital projects? So, so the, um, so 2025, the school has already been started and we're already incurring costs. Um, and the first uh, debt exclusion will hit, um, hit the tax bills already this year. So then the library we have scheduled for, for next year. Will we make that? I don't know, but that was the schedule. So we kept to that. And then um, the thought process for me was to have the DPW go third um, in 2027 and the first debt payment in 2027 starting work in 2026. That project has to go in phases because the building needs to come down. So first we need to set up some satellite spaces, find places for people to go while we take the building down. Um, and then the final one in 2028 um, yeah, would hit the debt. So starting in 2027, the fire station, that will not be as slow as the DPW because, because if we agree on the um, site of Hickory Ridge, we could start construction on that as soon as we had a project that was viable um, and we wouldn't have to move people around. They could stay where they are until that project was complete. So we could have four buildings built by 2030? Well, I mean, I don't know. Our track record is not so good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but what are we generally... <laughs> So sometimes constituents ask, I mean, what are we generally looking at for- I mean, that's the hope because the longer we put it out, the more costs rise. As you know, you received this presentation two years ago and the costs have already escalated, but at the same time, two of the projects have stalled. So we're just waiting on the developers. But I figured the sooner that we get going, um, the, the sooner we can come um, to that outcome and, and to these hurdles that we, we're gonna meet with every building project. And, and and have the time to overcome them. So yeah, that's the hope. Thank you. Councilor Lord. Um, thank you for this presentation. And thank you, Andy, for bringing up the regional school 
capital issues, because I know I heard from a lot of our constituents around the roof and there was a pool incident. But um, I'm going to ask a question because I'm new to this bond stuff and um, <laughs> finances. I don't know how often we get rated in our bond, but I noticed the fourth option, It we would save $37 million because it would be 118. So I'm like, is having a double A plus bond more valuable than that $37 million? Uh, no, um, but, um, but um, the that, that savings is because we don't have to borrow and that implies that we have the cash. And so the other risk to our, not just our bond rating is that that would basically wipe out all of our reserves at this current time. And I just, I, was, I would be worried about doing that because what if something came up with the schools and we needed to react to it? We need to have the that um, that other stabilization available so that we can react to something that is important. Other questions, Councilor Lord? Okay. Um, I'm gonna pause. I, don't know. I haven't had an opportunity yet to ask a few questions, okay? Um, for the, uh, in either of these, did you, I assume the feasibility update, it would be in the operating budget, not in the capital budget? So, we have feasibility money already. So, so we do have an appropriation for both DPW and fire feasibility work. Feasibility and schematic and, and engineering. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. I want that was in our we, previous we, capital. The council had previously appropriated a, a borrowing authorization for that. Uh, right. Uh, and uh, we have ample funds to get moving on it right away. Thank you. Um, the word feasibility was one, not the word I would have used. I would have used schematic. That's why I asked. Yeah, I think the actual council order. Um... We have uh, 1.7 million for DPW and 1.4 for fire. That's plenty for both. It's it, and the order is design and engineering is what the Thank word, you. language is. Okay. Uh, did, I didn't hear clearly. Did you say that this cost includes temporary workout space for DPW? I'm unsure. Okay. Be because, because I think that the number is, well, the DPW would tell you that the number is low. So, you know, um, the hope is that we can build a building um, in similar cost to the fire station that is smaller than their original wants and that additional funds would be needed to do the um, the temporary and swing space because the project is not as big as, as the original design. Okay. Um, how much does model four take from the reserves, the general reserves? All of it. Because it's $23 million. That's the only way you can get to that number. <laughs> okay, scrap that one. Uh, okay, and um, uh, I'll come back to my others because it really has to deal with a uh, referral to the finance committee and uh, coming back to the council for a decision on sites. So I'll go back to other counselors that have not, that have additional questions and Pam Rooney. Thank you, I had a question on sites. So I see that, that we're requested by December 2 to, to confirm uh, locations, if we are going to do that, can we please get diagrams and sort of not not schematic drawings, but at least diagrams of what's going where and well ahead so we actually have a chance to read it before the meeting if we're supposed to vote on it on December 2. It's And it's again, it's a little ironic after waiting for five years that we have two weeks to, to make it. So, so I will say that um, in the... Um, in the presentation that um, there, that's a rendering of the fire station at Hickory Ridge. I'm not sure where that came from. Dave Zomack provided that to me earlier today. Um, but the I know that all the work that was done for DPW to date was to on another site that mm -hmm. what that feasibility was is that it, that it couldn't go there and that we had to find a different site. So I don't think we have any sort of look of what this alternative, but the what what 
what has been learned so far is that the um, that the DPW site, the only available sites are the properties that we've already identified being yeah. the, the current location and the Ruxton site. Can I follow up, please? Please. Uh, so if we could at least get a sense of, even if it's just bullets of what functions are probably gonna go to which site, uh, so that we at least have a sense of what your distribution is trying to accomplish. Um, and even if there's a list of equipment that is being, what needs to be stored or needs to be housed can be outdoors. I mean, just they've got to have something on a back of a napkin somewhere for, for that kind of breakout. If if I may, please. The, the, one of the council's goals for the town manager for this year was to uh, bring to the council a request to set a location, and that's what this is intended to do. Um, so the, the the more specific details about each of those locations we'll get into once the council appoints once the town manager appoints building committee members, um, and then they'll begin to get more into the details of those sites and functions and equip where equipment is going and so forth. So at this point, we're just asking for the council's okay to move forward with those locations. Yeah, with having a little bit of that information would be very helpful in sure if we are supposed to agree to a site so, that's all I'm so saying. it's it's the idea in this is um to move the project forward as the council has said establishes the goal we can give you the information we have some information on some of that stuff but the more detailed analysis of the equipment the things that you're asking for pam is about the equipment and things like that that's a more detailed analysis i think that the building committee would really work on it's just more like can we get started in this direction is really what the question is. Is this an approach that you're going to be okay with? Kathy? Yeah, I'll follow up on this first. On, on the feasibility money, um, It's I, I do remember voting on it. What I don't know, Paul, is that sitting like there's an authorization, but we haven't drawn on it? There's an authorization, but we haven't gone out and incurred debt on it? Correct. Where we need I, to incur debt on it, and is that already in the debt model? <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. It's in the debt model. It's in the debt model. It's it's in the debt model. So if I looked, you know, we we've got a ten year uh, debt service model, and DPW is in with a big number, but I didn't ever see whether the piece of I'm di you don't have to answer it right now, but I'm just trying to figure out whether on top of the thirty five, we've got another X for feasibility, or that does that. No, it's it. in the um, debt model as existing debt because it's authorized, unissued. So it's um, in that blue line area. As, I'm, I'll be pretty simple. If we have X, we have about $20 million in reserves right now, as far as I know. But I know we also have five tucked away for the school. So there's another five. Is there another amount of money tucked away or is everything to do with DPW and fire going to become debt? So including these, feasibility, these, we authorized it, but we haven't spent it yet. You may but, need to show the graph up So here. the the articles previously authorized um, are not included in the, so for the DPW, they're not included in the 35. They're an additional 2 million, but that 2 million is part of what is projected as um, well, authorized but unissued debt. Okay, so we've already, it's in the debt service line the, already. The continuing okay. debt service so line. Th then I wanted to follow up on, I mean, I can double check, Paul, because we have long yeah. three. So I think what, what Melissa is saying is that in that, that checkered area, that's already the, the $2 million or $1.7 million is already counted it's... in there. And also, I would be careful about saying, we have got $5 million laying around. The five. The council has allocated the $5 million for the school project. That's spoken mm -hmm. for, unless you make a change of your right. decision. I didn't mean $5 million. I mean, it's, it's sitting in a, it's real money sitting in a reserve, which is why you show it being pulled out of a capital mm -hmm. stabilization, yes. as opposed to we have to borrow it. Yes. Right? We have to borrow it. So I'm, so, I'm pretty- And, and it is shown bank. on that slide I'm, with I'm the being, withdraw. So I'm being, we've put a pot of money here, here, and here, but in the case of the feasibility studies, we intend to borrow it. We've just already included. So then on Andy's, uh, this is for finance too, but the expectation that the high school roof and the middle school roof are now seriously in trouble. And one is in the acceleration program. 
I'd like if we can to show what that does to that other $3 million. I'm just worried about what the other three will need to cover for several years with this when Jennifer said we could have all these buildings in five years. We, and I'm thinking, except we won't have any roads, any cars and any roofs. You know, I would like to know that they're yeah, yeah, that, so you know, just to, because they're not in any of our capital plan right now. They it, don't they're exist. not in our capital plan because they have not provided right. that. Um, I mean, I know we know, but I, I only looked at what has already been authorized by uh, this council and and by the school committees and to my knowledge they haven't authorized uh, debt for um, their their capital needs as of yet I may be wrong about that but the information I have um, so yes you're right that and, and we talked about that earlier the three million dollars is a very small number um, but that is all that is left of that 10.5. And so we have to balance our priorities of how we fund our operating with how we fund capital. And the more projects we put in here, the harder it becomes. So I, I mean, I just didn't think that there was any um, need or appetite to move that allocation any higher. And believe me, I tried to make it a higher number and I just couldn't do it. Yeah, and I know this was also the tension in the earlier model, so I, I appreciate, and I'm, I'm mainly thinking that DPW, we have to get moving on it, so I'm not stalling on it, but fire might need to come later if we need the flexibility for that other capital that we can't just drain things because we need it for, mm -hmm. um, so, so it's just a thinking of where, where we have to be thinking of um, might be later. Right. So yeah. So you. the only, um, you know, and so there is that delayed model, um, which makes doing this easier, but it doesn't account for the other projects that come in, come in its way. Um, and so I'd also just, you know, the, the situation in those buildings are, are not great. Um, and um, so the question becomes at what point did they have a large repair that needs to be fixed right away that costs millions of dollars and we didn't move forward on this project. Those are the, the decisions that we have to make. Councilor Haneke. So, Councilor Lord made an observation I made, which is if you go with option four, you save millions of dollars for our taxpayers that could in theory go somewhere else if we can do something with it, right? Um, but I know it's risky. Um, we will be asked later tonight to allocate that $3.9 million to the Capital Stabilization Fund out of a surplus in FY24 of nearly $6 million. Um, if we go with your recommended model, Model 2, but by the time we need to borrow money for fire or dpw i guess fire in yeah because fire three years three years we've added another 12 million to the capital stabilization fund because we added and three I million would, every year after that i would say could pay we that. then yes it, would that be part of that flexibility that that we could have that that we can take a model now that works now with the money that's there but every year at the end of the year, as we see what surpluses we have, add to that three million on whatever, um, or change to a different model because there's more surplus. So that's my first question. A absolutely, and so the the um, committing to the fourth model is risky today and doesn't give us the flexibility to change. Committing to models um, two or or even one gives us a little more flexibility. I would say two more than one because we're continuing to add more to that capital and be more flexible for our um, uh, surprises, our surprises that we know about, you know, like. So, and, and just to add to that, I think that's the reason this is timely is that you are also having the conversation at the finance committee on your financial guidelines. And I know that you have talked about being tighter on your on the projections is there a way to be tighter 
that we produce less um, surplus. And so I think there's a, you know, if, if, if that's also a, a drive that the council would like to see you know, a finer tune on what those um, revenues look like or what those expenses are, that will impact what reserves come out. So my next question on these long charts, the black line is capital allocations and the blue line is net capital costs based on the projections you've made, which means the difference between the blue line and the black line that's not filled in would actually be capital that you could spend. So if we're looking at model two by 2037 ish, there'd be a little bit more in there. And by 2038, there'd be a little bit more. And by 2043, I know we're looking way out here now, there'd be even more. Um, well, right. So that, um, that but the, 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 the tension point of having to use the reserves in order to keep us under that line lasts between eight and 10 years. And of course, with the fourth model where we pay, where we have less debt, it comes quicker that yeah. we have room to, to increase that, that 3 million, but that 3 million would hold for however long it takes us to sort of use that, um, that drawdown and get us out of the, where we're over the line. Gotcha. And if I look at each of these models briefly, mm -hmm. that ongoing capital polka dot section seems to actually get bigger every year. So is the 3 million, 3 million plus inflation adjusted? Because it appears that those, especially like if you look at 2046 to 2057, the bottom of the polka dot on model two seems to be staying in the same spot, but the top of it seems to be going up. So, you know, I, I didn't think that it, it was, um, but I, I could look at the model again. I, I thought that it stayed level, but I see what you're saying. Thank you. Um, so before we make a motion to refer to finance committee, um, I want to make a couple other observations. This model assumes we're going ahead with the library. It does. And yet we may not. But the reality is we're going to spend at least that much money to repair the library. So taking the library out of here does not all of a sudden create a huge cash flow. Yeah, because I think then we would have a different problem, you know, to solve, which is the maintenance of that building, uh, similar to um, any of the other projects, you know, right. the maintenance of the current fire station, the ma maintenance of the current DPW building. Right. Um, so, yeah. that, and I, I would say too that um, the advantage of both the school and the library project is that they were able to secure other funds that make the overall cost of their projects um, less significant in these models mm -hmm. because of the matching funds that they were able to acquire. And could we, um, or should we be available to acquire similar types of funds for DPW or FIRE, then we would be in a much better situation. But at this time, I don't know of any programs for that. Sticking to the library, it is also my understanding that based on our MOA that we have with the library, that by a certain year, I believe it's 2026, they have to secure the balance of the money owed to us, not at the town's expense. That is my recollection of the MOA. And George, you showed us that last time. It's also linked to completion of construction, and so construction is later that date is later. So no, we don't get all the money in 26, which would be really nice. If we don't get, yes, one way or the other. But what I am saying is the securing of the balance is on the library at the end, not us. The other piece is, um, I just wanna mention two things. Positive, this does not take into account a possibility of a wonderful gift. It does not. Like we have seen from other towns. And one of the things that has happened in those other towns is that they have involved those institutions in the planning. And so I wanna make sure that as we go forward, we involve our higher ed institutions in the planning because that may incentivize them to come forward with some money. The other thing it doesn't take into account 
-hmm. is the fact that we have two, rep our representative and our senator both, along with the Mass Municipal Association, have already said that one of their biggest priorities this year, even though they are slimming down their priorities, is a municipal building bond, a municipal building authority that would cover other buildings besides libraries and schools. And so there may be some ways in which we could receive relief down the road. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose sight of those. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we should be advocating for those. I don't want to lose sight of the fact of the role in the council in advocating for those. And I, they have been mentioned in ongoing conversations with both uh, Representative Dom and Senator Comerford. Um, with that, I think what we need is a motion to refer to the Finance Committee. I don't know that the Finance Committee is actually the committee for the site, but I don't see what other committee it would go to. So, somebody want to try a motion? Well, I guess my question is what's getting referred and... Well, the model and then a recommendation to come back on which one of the, which one of the models the one, two, three, or four. So we we imagine that would be a question that would be addressed in the bug budget guidelines. In which case, we I don't think. need a referral to finance committee. Okay. If you wanted to take up the question of solidifying the locations along with the budget guidelines, which might make sense, then we can hold that to December sixteen until instead of December two. I think we need some questions from people. Our discussion on that. Yes, is that acceptable? That all rests with finance. I'm not sure that the finance committee can make a decision on siting. I agree with that. Yeah. Right. I think the council, that that's a council decision. I don't think there's a committee to refer it to. But the, the point you're making, Athena and Paul, is that the issue, first of all, of the borrowing, I mean, the uh, reserve of 10.5 versus lower, that's rest with finance committee to recommend. And the issue of the model could be uh, wrapped into the financial guidance. Yeah, I mean, it's already, but not this presentation, but the financial right. guidelines has always touched on those four building projects yes. to begin with. Right. So I've made some notes about as I okay. redraft those guidelines tomorrow um, okay. to but talk about the models. So does in that and draft some language related to that. Thanks. Does finance committee have any further questions then about how they see all this? Because we're kind of, we're not referring it to you, but we're assuming we're going to see some reflection of this back in the guidelines. Comfortable? Got it. George? So on December 2nd, we will still be presented with a decision mm -hmm. related to siting. Yes. Kathy? I'm just going to volunteer to send my questions in writing to you because I am going to miss one of the finance committee meetings mm -hmm. before we're supposed to do this in council. I'm going to be I know, I know. in a place that does not have internet. Some of us are envious. Um, okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this? M Melissa, thank you. You have done an absolutely terrific job of filling in a huge hole in a conversation that this council has been having for a long time. With your coming back, with your coming on board, we're now able to continue that conversation. And thank you for putting all the effort you did into making this presentation tonight. Thanks. Okay. Um, let me find my agenda. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I had my hand up. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Andy. The one thing that I think that the, uh, might be helpful for the council discussion is that some committee um, at least make inquiry of the staff, the leadership, and invite others from the staff of the affected departments on location and plan for their comments so that they can be um, reflected as information available for discussion of site location. I feel um, 
awkward making assumptions that this has support of either the line staff or the management staff of the key departments that we're talking about. So we work through our department heads and this has been vetted through our department heads. Nobody's super happy about everything. And I can guarantee that uh, it's either at the size, the, the scope or the scale. Um, everybody has a, an ideal situation, but this is the, the project. This is the, the model that we can move forward on. And they, I think the uh, initiative of getting a new building outweighs most everything. You talk to different staff members; they're all over. They're, they're different. They're all over the map. But you know, we're, this is. I think what's important is for our department heads to be the ones that say this. This will work for our department. If there are more specific questions that counselors have about the sites that um, we can try and answer before the next meeting, if you would send those on, and we can look for answers before the second. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to 8C. It's a proposal to establish school zones at Amherst Regional Middle School and Amherst Regional High School. I'm going to put a motion on the floor, seek a second, and then go to TSO for a report. The motion is to establish a school zone for the Amherst Regional Middle School with two, parentheses two, 20 mile per hour school zone signs installed, one on the south side of Chestnut Street for eastbound traffic, and one on the east side of High Street for northbound traffic with school zone pavement markings in accordance with the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the Massachusetts Amendments to this manual. Is there a second? Lord Shane seconds. Lord seconds. Uh, I, Andy, is it you or George that's speaking to this? I think I'm the one who's speaking to it. I'm going to be pretty brief because uh, we provided the report from the committee, which has the maps included that were prepared uh, at, on behalf of the committee by uh, the Department of uh, Public Works, EPW. Um, I, the, my, my reflection on this, though, is that at the last meeting, that it was voted for referral because of two concerns that we wanted to address, um, and uh, in particular, one was uh, to confirm that we can cite a uh, school zone uh, and particularly uh, on Triangle Street, whether that was uh, permissible under the law and regulations in the manual. Uh, and the second one was uh, whether uh, there was a desire from the, from at least one counselor that there'd be more specificity about what changes to the public way were than um, was in the original suggestion. And uh, so we took that very seriously. And uh, with the cooperation of the department, we really were able to move it very fast um, and uh, consistent with the uh, process used to establish a school zone the last time this happened, uh, back when it was done for the Fort River School, when there was no school zones at the Fort River School. Um, it uh, started with uh, the department asking its engineer, who happened to be Jason Skills then, and is Jason Skills now, to um, investigate and uh, make a presentation which um, he did very quickly and very thoroughly. And uh, so I uh, want to take this opportunity to recognize uh, uh, Jason and Guilford for having done this quality work in an accelerated time. Um, the last thing that I wanted to note was that there was also a question about the hours in which the school zone would be effective. And for the reasons stated in the uh, committee report, we don't include that in the proposed motion and don't, uh, and are suggesting that the, it is not really not a question for the council that um, the existence of the school zone affects the public way and is an effect uh, decision of the council 
but the the timing uh, is subject to change on a fairly free, uh, frequent basis as needs come. There is no precedent in any of the elementary schools of uh, the keeper of the public way, whether it had been the select board or the council having done so, so that uh, we uh, adhered for um, all of those reasons to not include that aspect of it in this proposal. Uh, the uh, uh, DPW staff, Jason in particular, is attempting to consult with the schools to establish uh, times, but we suggest that that be done administratively by the town manager in consultation with the superintendent of public works. So that's the committee report. Thank you. And I would I just want to note that we have two motions for this. The first one, which we've already made and seconded, is for the middle school. Are there any further questions? Councillor Haneke. It's unclear in the report. You had a statement that was a sentence that was embedded within the time issue that you just addressed that the school superintendent had not responded to DBW's inquiry. Was that inquiry just about times or was that about the need for school zones completely? Just about the, uh, just about the... Sorry, it's not on. Okay, uh, I was just about the question of times. The uh, I think that the schools were supportive of having school zones established, but the timing uh, at which the uh, lights would uh, flash and therefore they become effective was not uh, responded to, and that's uh, the aspect was referred to. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I apologize. I I did read the memo. I'm trying to reckon with not having the times in the motion, but the Massachusetts uniform ba 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 code says that they have to have the times um or at least say like when children are present and so will it have any sort of verbiage on there or I'm, I'm a little sorry and i apologize i'm trying to flip between three things just to settle it before it goes to a vote but maybe you can answer me faster than i can flip between tabs so are you waiting to see about the times and how is that then not out of alignment with what the um traffic code requires andy no all i can Say so as I said before, that we don't have a precedent for it. It was not done with Fort River, which was 2017. And the last time we established a school zone, it has not been objected to. It has been assumed that uh, the uh, timing would be an effective question to be determined by the um, uh, administrative staff along with the superintendent. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are days that there's uh, schools not in session, there are days that schools are in session for part of a day, but not an entire day. There are days when there's activities that go on later. And uh, I think that for uh, practical reasons, that if we can give flexibility to the, uh, when that's operational, it makes sense for all concerned. Uh, Lynn, if I may, I spoke with the superintendent about this question and he said that the, like Andy just said, it's variable and that we're able to modify it based on the school schedule. So that's something that would be modified on a routine basis. Okay, I think where my confusion is coming in is that it, the times can be modified, but it, it says it has to be posted on the sign. And it makes sense that that didn't happen for Fort River, Andy, because it was updated in 2022. And so I'm just trying to figure out where, it, if it's if it if I'm misinterpreting it, and Athena, if you're saying Guilford was said it doesn't need to be on the sign, um, because it also says it needs to be, uh, if there's flashing beacons, the municipality has to keep those written on file. So I'm just, I'm I'm trying to match everything up if we're not putting the hours on the sign yet. We so think. Yeah. So the motion itself says in accordance with the manual of uniform traffic control devices and Massachusetts amendments to this manual. So mm -hmm. if those are part of the manual. The motion would say you have to follow that. Right. right. But if, if TSO didn't establish those or write them, the signs won't go up until the school 
committee decides on them? Is no, that... no staff would carry that out in accordance with the traffic manual, like the motion says. So uh, if the council approves this motion, then the DPW superintendent will make sure that the sign is posted in accordance with the amendments to the manual. I'm just trying to figure out what the sign is going to say, um, because it'll say what the manual says. But the manual say. says that we have, it's just once you decide the hours, the sign has to say the hours. So the hours, will it will say the school hours. It, it's a, it it can say there's options. That's why I'm that's why I'm wondering, right? So the options are either you set the hours and you have to put them on there, and each each municipality can set the hours, or it can say um, it will say flashing when school is in session or when children are present or school days, and and so I, I'm just trying to again like I'm trying to figure out what the sign's going to say because it we have options there according to the code. All of them would be in, in accordance with the code, but. Oh who's deciding that option. So my understanding was that, like Andy mentioned, right. we didn't have an opportunity to speak with school staff and ask for their preference. Um, if this motion is approved, then the DPW superintendent would do that before printing those signs and posting them. If the council feels strongly about the exact words on the signs, then you could postpone the vote on this motion and, or you could amend the motion to include a specific choice. I'm not proposing pulling it or amending it necessarily. I just wanted confirmation that one of those terms would be used and that the schools would be, um, I think after our discussion with the council last time, that the schools would be the entity determining what, which uh, verbiage is used. Yes, yes, Andy. The answer is yes. Jason's map indicates when you look at the map itself, the signs will say, it begins school zone 20 miles per hour with applicable hours. So I don't, you know, I think we can confirm with, with uh, either Jason or um, Guilford after he's back. Guilford's uh, out of town at the moment. Um, what he exact, what the exact expectations are of what goes on the signs. But I think that the, uh, um, intent was that they would be applicable hours. In other words, the, whenever the uh, town manager agrees with the superintendent of schools that it's necessary and has a support of, you know, whoever he thinks is appropriate. Any further questions, Anna? No, I hope that the town manager in conversation with the superintendent will keep in mind the before school programs and after school sports as part of that discussion, as I'm sure the superintendent will. Okay. Are there any other questions at all? Then we're going to, if not, we're going to move to a vote on the first motion, which is the one that we've made and seconded. We'll begin with Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmerson, aye. Councillor Haneke, aye. Bob Hegner, aye. Lord, Councillor Lord, aye. Pam Rooney, yes. Councillor Ryan, aye. Kathy Shane, yes. Andy Steinberg, yes. Jennifer Taub, yes. Councillor Walker, yes. Uh, that's absent. And Anna Devlin got here, aye. It's unanimous. The second motion to establish, and I seek a second, to establish a school zone for the Amherst Regional High School with two in parentheses two, 20 mile per hour school zone signs installed, one on the north side of Triangle Street for southbound traffic and one on the south side of Triangle Street for northeast bound traffic with school zone pavements, pavement markings in accordance with the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the Massachusetts amendments to this manual. Is there a second? Second, Dublin got there. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Haneke. Did TSO have any discussion about putting school zone signs on Gray Street, Mattoon Street, um, or the five sections of Mattoon Street that there are, because there's like five of them, um, or Taylor Street? Uh, yes, uh, the superintendent of public works, uh, Mr. Boring, indicated that uh, there was not sufficient traffic on any of those streets that would um, warrant um, a school zone and that that was the conclusion that he had reached in consultation with uh, Mr. Skeels. 
did they talk to the school superintendent about that? Because Gray Street is where the buses come up from Main Street to enter the high school for drop off. That's where they turn from Gray Street onto Mattoon. Did they talk to the superintendent about just Triangle or any of the other locations? I'm not sure if they did or not. I mean, they they did their, they looked at it from the traffic engineer point of view and where, where's the traffic and where the, these flashing lights would go. Is there anything to prevent us from adding those at a future date? No. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Moving to a vote, I begin with myself, M and I, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Tubb. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis is absent. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ate. Aye. It's unanimous. All right. We're going to now move to the financial orders. Um, and I, I just want to ask Chair of Finance before we move, are there any of these you feel you need to speak to specifically with regard to any of these? Perhaps the one on... Um, the um, waste hauler. Okay. We we talked to, well, actually, the TSO committee talked to Guilford uh, about that. And um, he's, he clarified that, in fact, we only need, the, at this point in time, a consultant to help write the RFP and, and look at the results. And he thought 75,000 was the right number for that. Um, we discussed that we might need outreach further. We might need some help with outreach further, but we, we don't know whether we're going to recommend going forward with it or not. Depends on the RFP, the results of the RFP. So we couldn't really, there wasn't any point to um, authorizing that at the moment. We believe it should just, the, the difference should, the 50,000 difference should just stay in, in, in free cash for now. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to begin with these motions. Um, having a pu held a public forum on uh, November 18th with a recommendation by the Finance Committee to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY25 12A, an order appropriating for, from free cash to the stabilization fund for reparations and, and capital imprints, as shown on page 14 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Change seconds. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Nay. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis is absent. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. And Lynn Griesmer is an aye. The vote's 11 in favor, one opposed, and one absent. Moving to the next one. Having held a public forum on November 18th with the recommendation by the Finance Committee to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY25 05B and order appropriating funds for a portion of the Town of Amherst Capital Program dash roads and sidewalk repairs as shown on page 15 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Okay, are there questions? Anna. It's also a question, more of a statement. I, I'm i struggling with the these allocations and I, after the presentation last week and knowing that there was fun there were funds returned from the schools into this general pot that we're reallocating. Um, I have questions about processes in terms of whether the schools put forward requests for the that funding. Um, so that's kind of strain one that's more of the process question for this. But I have to say with this, I, I would like to see a minimum of um and and it pertains I'm picking on this one particularly, but 
I'd like to see a minimum of $56,821. And honestly, I would like to see this entire sum from the surplus funds reallocated uh, to the schools. We don't have the master plan for roads and sidewalks uh, that we've been waiting for. And I know that costs have skyrocketed on, on these, but we've upped that funding significantly in past budgets. Uh, there was one and a half million in FY25 specifically for, the, for roads and sidewalks. And to be honest with you, I'd rather have our school buses driving over potholes mm -hmm. to schools that are healthy and functional than driving over really smooth roads to a workforce of teachers that's crumbling and fewer options and unhealthy spaces to learn in. So I can't support this amount of funding for roads and sidewalks without allocating a significant amount to the schools from uh, the surplus funds that we have. Okay, Councillor Haneke. So I've been thinking the same thing. While I supported this in finance um, in the last six years on the council, there have been many councillors that have pushed for roads and sidewalks and spending on roads and sidewalks almost in front of anything else. And I've never been comfortable with it. I've gone along with it. I There are some roads in town that are crap, but um, to me, the roads are not in as dire a situation as many people paint them. Um, and after looking at our FY25 allocations in capital, it is striking to me that and I'm going to exclude the region and talk about the region in a different breath, but that of the four or five million that was allocated in FY25 capital through JCPC, very little of it actually went to the elementary schools. Um, given the split of operating budgets between the three or four functional areas, the capital split doesn't always seem as sort of near split like that. I'm gonna talk about the region a little bit because I think there's a misunderstanding from a number of people in town about how region um, capital spending works. The regional school committee has to make a vote on their capital allocations. And then only if they vote, does it come to the four towns to say yay or nay? And so while the region's capital allocation and our budget out of that five or so million is only about 400,000, we've, in my time on the council, not said no to a request from the regional school committee regarding capital, other than as it relates to AstroTurf or turf on a track. <laughs> so I do have to qualify that. But but beyond the track, we've always said yes to whatever the region has asked for for capital. And so if people are frustrated with regional capital spending, they really do need to start with the regional school district, not with us. Um, but that being said, I think it's time we wait to allocate a million dollars to capital spending outside of the capital um, stabilization fund to see if the regional school committee or the Amherst school committee have capital needs that could be used and better support our town beyond roads and sidewalks, because I don't think the roads and sidewalks are as dire as some of the needs that may not have been asked for by the school committees or that maybe have been asked for by the school committees, but because of how the JCPC report and requests come through the manager, we don't know how those um, advocacies have been working and may not have had as much advocacy within town to JCPC as they may be needed. So I want to wait on this one, leave it in free cash and come back to it 
So I'm going to vote no to keep it in free cash, basically, to in hopes that we will be able to come back to it in a month or two. Kathy Shane. First, it would have been nice to have more of this discussion in the Finance Committee, but um, I'm on JCPC, and there were no requests for schools for the current year. There are a few for Crocker Farm going out in spaces, um, but they weren't made as urgent, so they weren't they weren't vying for the budget we have. So if we decided to decrease this and push this into a capital budget, I would like to say it's for the schools to come to us. So what, what you're both act, saying is some part of capital. So we're in fact, if we're keeping the 10.5, we're adding another million or another something. Because if you look backwards, what we've done with the surplus at the end of the year, we did put a million dollars into track and field out of surplus. We put it'll be more than a million to track and field from our Community Preservation Act funds, Amherst Community Preservation. So it's not that there's nothing been going in. There weren't any capital requests from regional that were big like that, as you've just said. We need to have those requests. The big request for the elementary school was to build a new school. And that's a $99 million project. It's been funded in a different way, but the other school, pieces have been some IT, some different pieces. They've all been approved. So if the intent is to move more of it into school capital, we need capital proposals. So I would be comfortable with lowering this, not by all of it, but maybe half of it, and saying it's in addition to the 10.5 earmarked for schools to come. We're going to have a surplus in the current fiscal year, unless something goes crazy with our revenues, because the same revenues that were under predicted that gave us the surplus this year are also for FY25. So there will be a surplus at the end of when we, at fourth quarter, a year from now. So I don't know how to grapple with the absence of capital proposals from schools with the desire to spend some of the money on schools, but I'm willing to do a, there's an extra amount of money schools come in. And if Crocker's roof, so Crocker's roof, the HVAC system are the two big ones sitting on that. If the HVAC system is ready to get redesigned, let's do it, you know, and, and move it onto the do it list rather than the future list, which is the way it was presented to us. And anyone who wants to see these, you can see them out in the years, but it wasn't that they were moved off a list. They just weren't even on the list of requests. Andy. Well, <clears throat> a couple things. One is I would make no assumptions about what's gonna happen in the next fiscal year that we're currently planning for. There've been so many changes on the federal level and uh, it is going to, um, come down to states and localities in all sorts of unpredictable ways. So I would not, um, I would suggest not projecting that we're going to have some kind of large surplus um, at the end of the year that we haven't even developed a budget yet for. Um, so I, I know we're talking about the current one, but there have been people who have made a couple comments about, oh, gee, we're going to get a bunch of money again next year. I don't think that we can make that assumption, and that's the only point. That's the reason that I made that point. Uh, but the second thing is that uh, I, I urge on roads, I urge two things. One is that I urge all of you to um, raise your hand if you've heard from any of your constituents that they really are happy with our roads and sidewalks. And um, if nobody's raising their hand, I'm gonna make an assumption. But um, the other thing that we're gonna have to grapple with is that um, I'm not um, saying that TSO is uh, going to recommend the specific proposal for Southeast Street uh, in front of the new elementary school. Uh, we're uh, not even close to making that determination. 
And uh, I think that we've heard a, a lot of uh, reasons uh, that have been presented to us as to why this is um, an important project, but may not be the right solution. Uh, but one of the things that we do know is that there is going to have to be a solution. That the school was built um, at the decision of the building committee at the best location that it determined appropriate for the school, and they have come up with a spectacular um, proposal for building a school in that location. But the one thing that was not addressed in their deliberations was the question of what we're going to do about uh, essentially doubling the size of the school and getting the school buses and the um, parent and staff cars in and out of there on a regular basis, particularly when it coincides with morning rush time as people are trying to get to UMass. And uh, so we do know that something is fairly significant is going to have to be done there. And we have no apparent funding for that. So that is going to come out in the end from um, town capital funds and is going to drain what we can do in the future for roads. I suggest that we do as much as the roads as we can. And Mr. Mooring has indicated that uh, if this money is allocated, that there will be no problem getting it into a contract for this next year. Councilor Ryan. So we've taken $500,000 out of our capital budget for roads. And so one of the reasons I was pleased by with this is that at least would help make up that. Um, I think it, we clearly see the need. I'd be sympathetic to um, using some of this surplus for capital needs related to the regional schools if we actually had some kind of request, um, but we don't. We have a real genuine need for roads and sidewalks, um, and we have 500,000 that's just been removed. So I would urge us to keep this uh, as it is. Anna. So just to confirm, um, does the region come, the region does not come to JCPC. So just the elementary schools come to JCPC. So that would explain why no regional stuff comes to JCPC. And then, you know, I mean, JCPC has seen requests from the elementary schools, mostly Crocker as the other ones have deferred it for, for so long because they're hoping for that new building. Um, but we also, in our JCPC report, talked about how there's $6 million of anticipated expenditures for Crocker between fiscal year 27 and 29. We talk about how we might fund those um, uh, or how they might be funded from external sources, but we know they're coming. So, and, and Andy, to answer your question, I haven't asked people the question of, do you think our roads are great? But what I have heard a lot from my constituents is they're prioritizing the schools over everything else right now. And they want me to do the same as their representation. I think it's really unfortunate that we've set up the schools against the roads because they're different constituents in our, in many ways. But more importantly, I had the privilege of listening to the fi finance committee this last Friday. And I heard some really, really outstanding suggestions for where we might find money so that we could give the schools more money in the upcoming budget. Those particularly came from Councillor Haneke and also Councillor Shane. And so I really felt like that was going in the right direction. When we, when we decide not to continue to invest in our roads, I'm not happy about having, not having a five-year plan either, but when we decide to not continue to invest in our roads, we also continue to not listen to a whole other segment of our population who is complaining all the time about our roads. So I'm, I don't see this as a this or that. I see this as continue on that wonderful conversation in finance committee that you were having last Friday and continue to invest in our roads so that we can now book for next spring because the money is there. Because if the money isn't there, we can't book for next spring. So I am I just don't like saying roads or schools. I think there's plans out there that can come to both. 
Fraka. I'm sorry, Councillor Ate. I'd just like to say that uh, from the residents who speak to me, a lot more are concerned about the roads, and they are roads that are quite dire. And a lot of people drive on these roads, bike on these roads, walk on these roads where cars get to swerve because of the roads. I do welcome a conversation where we establish priorities for things that are concrete. And so there is space to consider between the roads and the schools. But I think we should pay attention to our roads. Um, Councillor Ryan, oh, actually, Anna, you have your hand up. Yeah. So, gosh, that argument just really frustrated me, Lynn. They're not different constituents. What? Everybody uses the roads. At most point, at many points, many people have used the schools. We are not deciding to not invest in our roads. We have done significant investments in our roads and sidewalks this year. We saw parents coming out with dinner in the oven tonight. We saw parents with their kids in the background talking to them while they sat in our meeting and made public comment for the first time, many of them. I would like us to, I'm really glad that people had innovative ways to fund the schools. Super excited about it, can't wait to hear them. What if we also spent some time thinking about innovative ways to fund roads and sidewalks? We cannot just rely on the squeakiest wheels and that's where we put our money. We need to consider that folks who cannot come to these meetings or seek us out all the time or know how to reach us, that just because they're not talking to us doesn't mean they do not have needs. We cannot just address the people we hear from because they know how to squeak louder. That's not to say their needs are not real. That's not to say that roads and sidewalks aren't important, but we know that the constituents who are most deeply affected by our schools are not the ones who have the opportunity to reach out to us as much as the folks who are not impacted by our schools. So I just want us to consider when we use this made up metric of how many people talk to us in district meetings or how many people can come to public comment, this is not a true measure. We need to listen to the priorities and take that in, but we also need to think about who we're not hearing from and why and what they care about. George, uh, Councilor Ryan. I'm reluctant to use one-time money to address what are systemic problems. If we were in fact talking about capital needs, and maybe that's what's being understood, then I would have a different view. But um, the issues that have been raised uh, in public comment this evening and in other venues deal with long-term systemic issues and spending of these kinds of monies that are available by chance every year, perhaps or not, is not the wise use of those funds. So I'm wondering in this discussion that was held in the Finance Committee, whether these uh, exciting new ways of helping to address the systemic issues in our schools involve the use of one-time funds. I would imagine they didn't. Um, so again, my objection is not roads and sidewalks versus schools. It's the proper use of this kind of money. Um, and with the schools, the issue is a systemic one. It needs to be addressed and hopefully we'll find ways to address it, um, but this is not the way to do it. Pam. Thank you. Um, I could support holding off on this million dollars of road money out the school, the, the regional school time to make an actual request. Um, if, if it worked in this manner, we make a contribution toward a capital contribution uh, toward the school system. If that allowed them to then free up money for operations in some other manner, um, I would agree with George that I don't really want to be paying for um, ongoing operations with guesstimated money. I know we've had a surplus the last couple of years. Um, is there any way that the school, if if we vo voted no tonight on the on the particular $1 million, does that give the school time to 
uh, come forward with a request and and is that even a logical trade-off within the school system? I'm looking at I'm looking at the finance people and the town manager for that. I'm not sure what your question is. If if we uh, if the school came to us and regional school came to us and said we need five hundred thousand dollars for uh, physical physical plant maintenance, and we provided that five hundred thousand dollars, which allowed them to then turn around and go to their operations and say, okay, we've covered this this uh, capital need. Uh, we're going to free up money for our teachers. And let them do the math within their bounds. So typically, this regional school district makes a recommendation at the at a four towns meeting, and they make their presentation during their budget process on what their capital needs are for multiple years, and then those four communities go back to their authorizing bodies, which is the town council in our community, or in the town or the town uh, meetings in the other three towns, and get appropriations those committees based on a plan of action of um, what I think you're referencing is like, would the town make a gift to the regional school district? That would be a gift. They could do with it however they would like to use it for. But I think that needs to start with an appropriation request from the town manager at this point. Pam, was there for the questions? Okay, Jennifer? Yeah, I'm kind of uh, picking, continuing that. Please uh, speak to I'm the kind mic. Of, um, continuing that line of questions. But so if we were to split the difference, since we reduced what was um, appropriated for roads and sidewalks, I believe last year by $500,000. So we authorized $5,000 from the free cash for roads and sidewalks, and then were to give the other $5,000 as a gift to the regional schools <clears throat> for something like repairing the getting rid of the mold in the middle school or towards the a new roof in the middle school, which we're always hearing is in dire, which it is in dire condition. Is, is that an option? I mean, when we give a gift, we can give it for a specific reason or we could, or they could ask us. And I, I guess that's what I'm wondering, can we split the difference and give it as a gift to the regional schools? So the question before the council is whether you want to appropriate a million dollars to the roads or not. That's the only question that's before the council. Mm -hmm. um, if you were, I mean, there are a million needs in our community. If you want to put money into a roof, the DPW is waiting for a roof. There's a million things that we could put money into. The question before you tonight, and the only thing that's on the agenda is a million dollars for roads or not. It's a, it's a, it's a, or you could lower the amount, um, which is within your purview. But that's really what the question is. Okay, um, are there any other, so the, the motion on the floor is a, about appro tra appropriation and transfer order FY25-05B. It's on page 15 of the motion sheet. That motion's been made and seconded. Are there any further comments? Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. So I think, I am having a difficult time processing my thoughts around what is being discussed right now, um, because I think a lot of things can be true at one time. And I think that that's the case here. Um, and so I really appreciate um, Anna's reflection and, and wanting to pivot here in response to some of the overwhelming comments that we heard today at our budget forum. And I think that that feels very appropriate uh, for me right now as well to, to really be responsive to what we're hearing in terms of the needs in our community and to at least give more time to think about ways that we could address these things, whether or not it ends up being not voting to pursue money for repairs to roads and sidewalks, then so be it. Um, and I also know that our roads and sidewalks also need repair. Um, and so 
I also don't like this idea of thinking that we have to take one or from the other. Um, and I think Jennifer's suggestion of wanting Paul to consider and look into the possibility of presenting us with other options here um, is a real possibility. Um, and so I think that this is something that I supported at the finance level. And I, I do want to see some kind of investment in our roads and sidewalks, but I do think that right now I'm prepared to vote no in the hopes that the town manager might consider an alter like proposing an alternative option to us where we might not have to pick one or the other. Or I know that's not what we're being asked to do, but that's what the conversation has turned into. And so can we consider other options at this point? Okay, so the motion on the table is for the financial order. The financial order, which is on the motion sheets on page 16, is for a million dollars to roads and sidewalks. During this discussion, there's been a variety of options thrown out, but no motions. One of the options thrown out is to reduce that number by 500,000. That would require a motion to reduce it, and then we would then have to vote on the transfer order. If we want something else to happen, we don't have a financial order for anything else to happen. So um, at this point, the motion on the table is for the million dollars. Councillor Ette. I'd like to call the question. Okay, the question's been called. I'll second that. Thank you. Um, we're going to vote. The question's been called. We move to a vote to the question being called. Um, So we're voting on whether to call the question or not. This is not on the question. the question or this not. This is a vote to end debate. Yeah. End debate. Exactly. That means no question can be asked. Bob Hagner. No, no. Um, I'm sorry. There, sorry. Clarify. A clarifying question. Yeah. So, I don't so know if the, it's clarifying or substantive, but does that mean this million dollars goes away or comes back to us in the no, first seven? We, we first of all vote on whether to end debate. If we end debate, we then move immediately to the question. The motion that's on the table is the million dollars for roads and sidewalks. Then we continue to debate, during which time somebody can offer a motion to amend. Okay. Does that does that clear it for everybody? Okay. Uh, we start with I don't know, Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. No. Councilor Ryan. No. Kathy Shane. So I'm clear. I'm voting to end debate now. Yes. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. No. Councilor Walker. Yes. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. And then Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Okay, we move immediately to the question. The question is um, whether or not to authorize to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY2505B, an order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst capital program, roads and sidewalk repair. Any further question? No, excuse me. We just moved to the question. Okay. Uh, in this case, we begin with Councillor. I'm sorry, Pam Rooney. No. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. No. Councillor Walker. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Councillor Ette. Aye. 
Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? No. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Nay. It's six to six. That's a failing vote. It's a failing vote. Thank you. Okay. That one fails. We're skipping over the next one, which is the issue of the sidewalk uh, equipment. And we're moving on to the motion to amend appropriation and transfer order uh, FY 25-05D and order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst capital program waste hauler study by reducing the appropriation from 125,000 to 75,000. Is there a second? second? Thank you. Is there anything else we need to discuss on this one? Okay. Yes. Quick question. And that is if it reduces from 150 to, to 75 or whatever the, the, the difference is, what happens to the difference that uh, is um, freed up? Stays in free cash. It goes to free. free it cash. stays in free cash, which means, right. Okay. Any further questions? All right. Then we're going to start with Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Tell me which one we're voting on right we're, now. We're voting on the money to, re, we're voting to reduce the amount of the financial order for the waste hauler from 125. Fine. Yes. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Aye. Okay. That reduces it. And so now the next thing we're going to do is actually vote the 75. Okay. So having held a public forum on November 18th with a recommendation by the Finance Committee to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY25 05D and order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst. To Amherst Capital Program Waste Hauler Study, as shown on page 17 of the motion sheet, and amended by the redu reducing the appropriation amount to 75000 Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Are there further questions? Councilor Ryan. Am I voting? Yes. I started the last one. Okay, I'll start with Council with I Kathy Shane. Thank I'm mixing it up. Yes. You know, keeping you awake. Kathy, yes. Andy? Yes. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer? Aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Okay, that one's unanimous. Okay, having held a public forum on, on November 18th with a recommendation by the Finance Committee to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY25-116, I mean 16A, an order appropriating from free cash to the opioid settlement special revenue fund is shown on page 18 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Then in this case, I believe I begin with Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis is absent. Elena Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. It's unanimous. 
12 in favor and one absent. Okay, we now move to the town manager evaluation. Um, we can do this in a number of ways, but let me suggest one way that we do it. And that is that we have a conversation that stays at a high level and that you send me any edits and or recommended changes. And I will set a deadline for that and I bring it back to you as a next draft on December 2nd. Okay. Are there comments at this time? Seeing none. Okay, Pam Rooney. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of the staff and the town manager in accomplishing everything that gets done in this town on an annual basis. So thank you. Councillor Haneke. Um, I think it was much better written than last year. So I'm going to start with that. So thank you. Because um, <laughs> I know I was kind of hard on you, Lynn, last year. Um, so thank you for for your care this year. Um, the distribution of ratings by goal within counselor is really hard to interpret and read. So I don't know. I, I understand what you're going for. Yeah. yeah. I understand what you're going for, but I wonder if there's a better way to do it. Um, I, so I, I would just ask that you think about I hope that. It, um, and the only thing I was trying to show is that um, people just rate things differently. It's not for any other reason than to say, you know, some people just basically say it's this versus this and other people say it's this versus this. I It was a way of stressing that point. I actually considered not including this table. Okay. And I, I'm more than glad to eliminate it. I could go either way. Um, two other comments. The first one is a couple places in here. There's the use of um, I or me. I okay. would get rid of those mm -hmm. where council. I know it's probably from a cut paste from comments, but there were just a couple of them that yep. just seem inappropriate. And then the very first sentence, um, I know it's nitpicky, but it reads the town manager exceeded town councilor's expectations and all, but that's not actually accurate um, because exceeded is commendable, not satisfactory okay. or commendable. So it needs to say met or exceeded. Thank you. Or met because exceeded is met, but yeah. exceeded is not accurate. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments, Kathy? Um, I'll just, I've got a couple I went through in the time we had, I actually read all 13 of our things pretty fast. So there are a few places where I think you've pulled from only one or two, but missed a place where seven okay. or eight people said a similar thing. So I'll just flag those. Um, yes. And then Mandy's on the first sentence. I'm not sure one of the goals, infrastructure, was even a majority, Mandy. So yes, I was going to do met or exceed, so it may be on 12 out of 13. So I'll just double check my math on that. I will check on that one as well. So I think infrastructure didn't meet the okay meet that. So but but for the rest, when I went through it, it looked accurate. Just and in terms of the staggered bar by counselor, mm -hmm. which was no mic so microscopic, I couldn't read it. I'm not sure it's worth doing. So okay. I I guess I'd just recommend deleting it and then saying counselor's opinion. It, Councillor's scores varied a lot and had some interesting variations. C, it's you know, and then do the link to the whole set yeah. of them. Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes. Uh, oh. Bob Hegner, you had your hand up. Okay. Yeah. When I look at the ratings, 
Sorry, I just can't hear Bob on Zoom. I'm sorry. Uh, I For the third paragraph, I would say seven or eight counselors rated the town manager because I had like 8.5, 8.5, right. 7.67, and 7 in the four when I counted them up. So I would just make that minor change. Fine. I, I will have to say when people have given me Point three, point three, you know, they yeah. basically, I mean, I had to come up with judgment calls. And that, frankly, is one of the reasons why the one goal that's now in question is a judgment call. So it's because of point three, three, point three, three, and point three, three. And you can continue it out. Um, Bob, was there anything else? Okay. No, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, it's a fairly minor point, but it's actually a factual question. On page seven, you refer to uh, the university drive area as a village center. Oh. And actually, under the master plan, it's not. it is not a village center. Okay. And I think under the master plan map, it might even be encompassed within the downtown within the downtown zone, because uh, that's a circle when you look at the map and the master plan. But I think that needs to be checked before that's assumed. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Pam Rooney. I just had a quick question on the on the numbers um, of on the top line of your of your tallies. How do you get 8.5? or a 7.5? Because several counselors came in with things like 0. 0.5 and they came in with two X's. So I assigned oh. them, I, I would read through and then I would assign them 50-50 or in one case, one counselor said four this way and two that way. So I said 80% and 20%. That's one reason why I want you to check and tell me what you want assigned for those percentages. Thank you, that answers my question. Okay. Um, Jennifer, I'm looking at you. Well, that's one reason I look forward to the next agenda item where you set the goals and the format for next year because they're so disparate within one category that it's hard, it's impossible to get one. But I just also want to, is there, so you did a great job, but there are a couple typos. Mm -hmm. So how- Please send those to okay. me. Okay. Okay. And I will tell you, I did spell check on this thing. Yeah, no, spell Q and grammar. Q U E? It didn't pick it up. Okay. <laughs> it did not pick it up. Andy and I just had this conversation earlier. He's had the same problem with spell and grammar check lately, too. It doesn't work. Okay. Um, Councillor Lord, you had your hand up. It was going to be a quick edit that I'll email okay. you. So this is what I need you to do track change, send it to me. I would like to receive it, if po at all possible, by the end of the day on Wednesday, because I really don't want to spend my Thanksgiving doing this, okay? Are there any other questions or comments? I don't think I have it in Word. So I... I'll send it to you in Word. It's in, it's in Word on the... I will send it to you in Word. Tina, you put the Word version of this in with all the others, right? Yeah. I think I put it in Word and SharePoint. I'm double Yeah, in SharePoint. Right okay. Don't worry. I'll send it to you with a reminder. Get it to me by COB Wednesday, okay? Um, are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we're going to move on. Anna, you want to talk about next year? There will be no decimal points. Allowed. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So um, I wanted to talk through this because it was a very late add to your packet, but in the packet, there was a uh, colorful chart that GOL has been working with to draft out the town manager goals for 2025. Um, and w I wanted to walk through the goal areas. This is where GOL has been focused thus far, um, and we are now going to be shifting our focus into the objectives and action items in our coming meetings. Um, thank you to everyone who sent me feedback on the prior 
uh, list. And um, I'm hoping, I'm just going to say this. My goal is that by bringing repeated iterations to this council, that I will encapsulate your feedback as we go through. And when we get to that final discussion, there won't be major foundational shakeups. That's my goal. Just going to name that now. That means you have to give me your feedback throughout this process. Please don't save it till the end. I will be very sad. So, and if that's what you want, there are plenty of other ways to make that happen. Um, so goal, sorry, it's late. I'm, I'm tired. Goal area. Uh, many of these stayed the same, but what GOL ended up doing was consolidating several of them that felt redundant. Uh, as a reminder, goal area is the biggest, broadest picture of what we're focusing on. So we are going so far with climate action stayed the same. Community health and safety stays the same. I'm focusing just on the purple column right now. Uh, economic vitality, housing affordability. Those are all the same. Racial equity and social justice, all the same. Then we started to consolidate a bit more. So the first mega category, nah, I don't like that. First consolidated category is administration and leadership. This is a combination of the prior categories, including personnel management and finance. This is really what GOL was thinking about was the, um, sorry, that line shouldn't be bold. Is it still bold in there? Yeah, it shouldn't be bold in there, but that's my bad. Um, this is really the town manager doing the work of managing the town, right? This is the managing the people um, and uh, the, the workforce and the financial health of the town. So administration and leadership administering the duties of the town. And then the next combo category is infrastructure management, maintenance, and land stewardship. So this was a combination of the prior categories, uh, including infrastructure and capital projects. Um, you know, we know that our capital projects are critical and very important. And what GeoVol was discussing is that breaking them out into their own goal area isn't necessarily helping in terms of getting them to be they aren't their own big goal area. That's part of our infrastructure. It's part of our, our capital development. So we added those in together. Uh, and then lastly, the last combination was community and strategic relationships. And this brought together community engagement, relationship with the council and relationship with higher ed. So these three areas, are, yeah, the three management goals, this really is us trying to encapsulate the man, the executive part of the town manager's job, right? So working with the with the residents, working with the council, um, keeping our buildings functional and our fleets moving and uh, not financially tanking the town. So those are those are my initial proposed names for the categories, but we landed on this. So within those, GOL did start discussing, uh, let me pause there actually. We will talk about the blue column in a second, but just for goal areas, I'd like to see if there's any feedback on these, uh, specifically the consolidated ones, or if there's anything that you're like, we don't need economic vitality anymore, take it out. Uh, any any feedback on the goal areas thus far? I am not scrolling. Athena, could you scroll up to the top? And this is in the packet uh, now as well. Kathy. I applaud the effort to get to fewer total. So I think I, Sorry. I think it's a great idea Thank you. that you've gotten to fewer total. So my request as you continue to work with this is that within these categories, make sure they're really distinct. Because if I'll take a couple examples, community health and safety and later on uh, race, race and ethnic, race and discrimination had some similar actions right. underneath them. So if they're not distinct enough, combine them, you know, in terms of whatever comes on the action item. Uh, similarly, in economic vitality, it had a lot of housing in it. So I found myself looking at housing under that one and housing again under housing. So, you know, just make, do a similar, it goes in once, not twice. Uh, because housing clearly is part of vitality, so I don't care where it goes, but but don't have similar actions. So, so that would be my request in doing this. Then the very last one, if you go to the very bottom, um, your consolidation, I like consolidation. The wording on uh, very, very last one, keep going. There, community and strategic relationships. I think when it comes to the University of Amherst College and Hampshire College, 
we're looking for money, not just getting along well. So, you know, in terms of investments, uh, so it's the wording on this one, Anna, not, not the piece, but just good relationships that we collaborate and we communicate. It's strategic, you know, strategic partnerships that yield results for the town. Um, so just try to figure out some way of wording that and I think what you meant to do with the last one is similar. It's we're looking for changes in state policy that will help the town. So this is the executive and the legislature working together to get resources for the town. So it's not just policy lead, but it's you, you see see what I'm saying. You know, that are you the, talking about in the blue? The, the, blue box? the blues assistance support the council on providing mm -hmm. policy leadership, developing, revising. It, it there's there's a piece in this in that the goals were actually again to be focused on areas that would really help the town so just mm -hmm. i like the combination but just make sure each of those three is distinct and focused thank you um any other feedback focusing per ideally first on the uh purple anything else on pur pink purple whatever i don't see any other hands okay so then the blue so GOL didn't get all the way through blue. And so I want to just kind of reiterate that these are very much in pencil um, and not everything has been pulled over yet. I don't want anyone to read this and think we're only pitching one thing in some of these categories or nothing in some of these categories. So um, we pulled over some of the objectives just from the, um, from the last version. Um, and the ones that I want to focus on, and I'm going to look to my folks who are at GOL at our last meeting. I actually, Athena, if it's okay, I'd like to work from the bottom up. Um, and thank you. Uh, Cause these are the ones we really, we talked about the most. So if we can start with community and strategic relationships, one thing that GOL is working, it's a loose guideline, but we're seeking to have no more than three objectives per um, goal area. If one needs to have more, we can have that discussion, but as a, as kind of our guidelines, that's what we're seeking to, to try to hit. Um, and this, you know, we've got three here focusing on, um, supporting the council, building relationship or developing positive relationships, uh, with the, uh, the colleges. Um, and then we have, uh, policy leadership with the council. So we haven't articulated necessarily the community engagement aspect of this yet. We know that's on the docket too, but Again, knowing this is in pencil, would love to hear thoughts just firstly on community and strategic relationships, just to keep my head on straight. Thanks. Councilor Haneke. So this is the one that stuck out to me in that you combined community um, community engagement into this and then didn't really talk about Not it at yet. all. It's not um, yet. <laughs> But what also struck me was two of the objectives related directly to the council. And so to me, that seemed like both of them could be combined into one, if, especially if you're st sticking to st try to stick to three. One is council objective, one is higher ed objective, and one is community engagement objective seems to make sense to me. Thank you. Bob Hegner. Yeah, I was going to make the same point that I, I didn't see residents or community at all in here. And we just need to put it in somewhere. Absolutely. Thank you. Jennifer. Was, I agree with what Bob just said. And also with Kathy, you know, really a, a large part of the strategic partnership with the uh, Amherst College and UMass does is related to financial support. I mean, let's just cut to the chase. Um, yeah, so even like to address areas of mutual concern, yes, but what's our concern, it, it feels like we, I don't know that the institutions see it as mutual concern. It is, they may not. Okay, are there any, that way. Anna? Uh, there... No, thank you. Um, if that's it for that one, the couple more that we did get to, uh, infrastructure management, maintenance and land stewardship. Um, again, these are kind of keeping this broad. We had maintain and manage the town's capital and public assets uh, and make progress on major capital building investments consistent with council votes. Please scroll up. 
Thank you. Sorry. You um, and, and I want to be clear on this one because there was a lot in the old goals and there were a lot of things listed here that were more of action items. Um, I think one of them was talking about surplus pro property. One was, you know, uh, presenting a financing plan. Those are all action items. And so these were the, these were the two bigger picture outcomes that we, um, were working, working on. And you got room for one more if you, if you see it, but any feedback on these ones? I see no hands. Excellent. Okay. I mean, not excellent. Always welcome your feedback. Sorry. Um, okay. Administration and leadership. So we've got, please, please scroll up. We've got four in here. Um, they average out Paul, I promise. So, um, effectively, oh, this was one we had a lot of discussion about and Mandy, I'm, I'm seeing if you've already raised your hand. Okay. Uh, because there were a lot of really specific references to sections of the charter in the last set of goals. And what we tried to do here was say, look, do your job as it's outlined in the home rule charter. We tried to really zoom it out a little bit. And the reason was, I think George raised this, I want to give George credit for this. Um, George raised the point of the town manager goals are a really helpful tool to use when we communicate with the public about what we're working on uh, and, and what the council does and what the town is working on really. Um, and we want this to be readable. If folks would like to reference the home rule charter, they can go back and look for the um, operations of the town and the role of the town manager in it. Um, we felt that it got a little bit muddied up when we started referencing specific sections. Uh, and then, and we didn't wanna leave anything out. Um, then the next part we had here was maintain essential municipal services and improve the delivery of services to restaurants at uh, restaurants. I'm hungry. I think, uh, residents and businesses, I have so many snacks. Uh, so this was a combination of two last time. There was one that said maintain services and then one that said improved service delivery. Um, and so we worked that into two. We would like them to not get worse is the idea. Um, or sorry, we want them the services to be maintained, but improve the delivery of them where possible. Um, foster proactive anti-racist culture throughout all town departments and uh, effectively supervise and manage the town's workforce to improve cooperation and coordination across departments to ensure the town's strong financial and fiscal health. I think there's one more in the next. Oh, it got broken up. That's that's actually one one box. It's once, I think it's one box. You don't think so? Are there any comments? It might be two boxes. Ignore that. Sorry, that is, it's a separate one. We have four, <laughs> five. It's not. Pencil. Pencil. <laughs> um, this one was really all about continue to give us balanced budgets. We appreciate those, that kind of thing. Um, the fiduciary responsibility to the town. Sorry, I was confused. It will be a full sentence by the time it's done. I promise. Okay. No comments. I'm trying to raise my hand. Pam. Oh, sorry. I, Pam. I was not clear in that conversation going back and forth. If the if the um, financial the the one that we can't see. It's its own. It's its own box. That was my mistake. Yeah. I think Actually, they are no. very. I think they're quite separate, and I wouldn't Should. really want to see them mashed into the improved cooperation and coordination across departments. They're just two different things. It it was meant to be part of leadership. And what Pam is saying, she want, would like to see it separated out. Yeah, a fourth, a fourth objective. I'm going to make uh, a note to have the discussion with GOL to confirm the way it was and to that that Pam noted to separate it out. Um, okay. as a separate one. Thank you. Anything else? Give me one second to type that note. Councillor Haneke, you have your hand up. Yeah, with that fourth one. Um, the way it reads, are you re the effectively supervise and manage the town's workforce to improve cooperation and coordination amongst depart across departments. Um, I don't think that's the only thing we want the manager to do in supervising and managing the workforce. So I think that's too specific as the objective. At least I don't want him 
just to supervise and manage solely to improve cooperation and coordination. Um, I, I, I want some other things in there too. So I think that second half of that is a bit too specific for the objective. Okay, thank you. Um, and okay. you have oh, your hand sorry. up still. Okay. So the other areas we have not, GOL, I'm looking at you, we have not really delved, del dove. We have not really discussed at length. <laughs> um, we've pulled over uh, from from prior uh, from prior versions, but we did cut a bit. So um, I don't necessarily want to go through these bit by bit with the full council, but would welcome typed uh, emailed feedback. Um, GOL will be continuing our discussion on this on Thursday. So if you have, this is the, we're slowly moving objectives over from the, the um, last year's goals. So if you don't like anything that's penciled in here uh, or you would like to see something else, please tell me before Thursday. Um, and I'm gonna to turn to my other GOL members to see if my tired brain missed something big. No. Okay, thank you. Um, that'll do it. So hopefully we'll come back to you again soon with uh, some more full sentences and the objectives and a bit. And we will also be meeting with Paul or I will, at some point, Paul will be um, connecting with us to make sure that what we're bringing to the council is feasible. Um, that's our, a, a key priority as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we've done appointments. We're going to move on to any council, uh, any committee or liaison reports. CRC, Pam? Uh, yes, that there will be a meeting on 1126, and that is a the opening of the public hearing for the University Drive overlay. It will be immediately continued to December three. Um, the meeting on the 1126 will continue on as a solar bylaw. I want to make note that we put the meeting time on 1126 for 6 p.m. And I just want to double check with all the members because that's what the public notice says. And um, it's six o'clock, not 630. I've already said I can't make it if it's going to be a full meeting. You said it was going to be longer than 10 minutes and I can only do 10 to 15 minutes, so I won't be there. So it's too late to change it back to a normal 6.30 time period because I've already uh, noticed the meeting for 6 p.m. So let's be clear, you have to notice that hearing for six o'clock. The hearing's already been published for 6.05. The meeting is okay. posted for 6 o'clock. Do you have a quorum for that night? I believe so. Okay. Then you can convene the hearing and continue on. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. Uh, elementary School Building Committee? Anything, Kathy? Uh, well, we met really briefly on Friday. We might have been a historic brief time to hear an update that there is no update. Um, however, one of the things that's happening is we're maintaining that early site package. Uh, that uh, investment will be ready to have the school built. And you heard earlier that Paul still has no news when the AG is going to decide. I mean, I think one thing on this is that all three bids were below the budget we'd set. Um, so hopefully when a decision comes, we can move quickly. The The only other thing to note is that Paul shared what we, our attorney gave to the AG in terms of uh, in additional information that was requested. And I've shared that with the committee. Right. Uh, Bob, finance. Yeah, the Finance Committee met the last two Fridays, and I sent a I'm report. Sorry. It's in the packet of, of what happened. Um, we're going to meet again this Friday. Uh, we're going to focus on the guidelines, and I guess we have to clean up the <laughs> the, the the snow snowplow situation. 
So uh, um, anyway, um, I think those are the, the main things that we're going to focus on. This uh, Anna, you have a question? Um, it's okay. It's just a statement, uh, but it is for finance. I, I really do hope the finance committee will prioritize the schools and consider recommending a higher allocation as you're discussing um, budget guidelines. Uh, recommending a higher allocation go to the schools this year. I think that a lot of our council in reflecting on our council discussions, a lot of our conversation has felt like we are attributing much of this to planning and um, or or a, la a perceived lack of planning or something like that. And, and I just, I don't think that anyone on this council is is thinking that that is the only reason, right? I think that that's just been a dominant narrative for some reason. Uh, and the, the bigger reality here is that towns across the state are grappling with this and really deeply, deeply struggling. Uh, and I, I just would like to share my thought with the finance committee members as you go into these budget guidelines that we as a municipality have an opportunity to meet this moment. Like we have met other moments in the past and with the creation of other departments and changing budgets for that. Uh, we have an opportunity to meet this moment and support our schools. And I hope that the budget guidelines will reflect that. Kathy? I would just respond to that. Uh, look closely at the various forecasts and figure out where we get the money from, because that's exactly what we started to say. You know, if it was instead of three, something more, if if the one-time gift wasn't a gift, it went on to the base, each of those raises those lines, and we can't have a deficit. So trying to look at how, how do we do that. So that, Thank you. that's... That's the, um, uh, and these are guidelines, you know, so we have to figure out some instructions that achieve that. Thank you. Uh, GOL, anything else, Anna? Uh, GOL is meeting on Thursday, right? Yeah, Thursday. <laughs> um, and we will continue our discussion on the town manager's goals. We also will be um, working on the 2025 Human Rights Day proclamation and the uh, proclamation that was referred to us today regarding the expansion of the uh, uh, opposing the expansion of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion School. So if you have thoughts on um, either of those, remember GOL is just looking for clarity, consistency, and actionability. Uh, otherwise, just you can tell us how much you appreciate us. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Jones Library, Pam and Paul. There will be a meeting tomorrow for the Jones Library Building Committee. Uh, there are a flurry of invoices to be paid for uh, services during the value engineering phase that uh, that went they went through prior to the bid. And I'm hoping that there will be a pretty robust conversation about the next steps for the Historic Preservation Act section 106 and how it gets addressed uh, coming quickly. Okay. Um, I just need to note that um, Alicia left the meeting at uh, 10.54. Okay. Uh, are there any questions for Pam? Um, uh, Andy, TSO? We well, have a TSO. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer. You had your hand up. So maybe I should wait till the town manager. Maybe. Report? Yeah. Okay. Because I had a okay. question about the Jones. Great. Uh, TSO, Andy. Uh, you saw the TSO report of the last two meetings, and so unless you have questions about that, I will uh, not go any further into that subject because. Uh, but there's one thing, and that is that. Uh, as you know, the most difficult assignment that you have given to us, probably because it's the most difficult one that was given to the council, was the uh, Fort River location school, the uh, proposal for revising traffic between uh, Main and uh, College Streets. And uh, we were, as I have previously reported, uh, trying to organize a joint meeting with uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and the Disability Access Advisory Committee of three committees. Um, it, and uh, Guilford was going to not only be present himself and with his staff, 
but he was going to try and include the um, representative of the firm that helped that advised them on the design. And the likely date is now uh, December 12, I believe, at either 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Uh, that has had the greatest uh, uh, degree of uh, positive response from all three committees. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to finalize that. <laughs> but I wanted to alert the entire council to it. And uh, I think you have to uh, um, advise the uh, president as to whether it needs to be uh, a meeting of the entire council in addition to the three committees. Um, I uh, am not the one who makes that decision. What date is that? Uh, December 12th. Is that, that's right, this is Athena. December 12th at what time? Either five or six. And it's a joint meeting of? Uh, PAC and TAAC, Transparency Advisory and Disability Access Advisory, and TSO. It's going to be a hybrid meeting so that it'll be um, in person for anybody who can attend. And uh, we're going to uh, make accommodations uh, for those members of any of the committees who cannot attend in person. Um, unless the chair of TSO would like it to be a committee of the whole, I don't necessarily see it unless there's so many people who would like to go from the council. And if they do, then we'll make it a committee of the whole. You can also sit in the audience or not. So I'm not seeing it overwhelming. So it sounds to me like it's going to be just a joint meeting. Okay. Um, any liaison reports? Okay. Town manager report, Paul? Sure. So as you enter your seventh hour of this meeting, and breakfast will be served. Um, yes, thank you. I did just have one thing I want to mention to the counselors is that when you go home tonight, you may smell smoke. There's a large brush fire at UMass between Orchard Hill and Maine in the Maine UMass campus, about two acres were involved. So it's contained, but uh, they'll go back to the site, it, but it's still smoldering. So they'll go back to the site tomorrow to keep working on it. But just so you know what's going on. Our questions of the town manager. Jennifer. Um, yes, I had a question. The um, please speak to the oh, mic. yeah the transmitter we got today about uh, an extension being requested of mm -hmm. the MBLC. Yeah, if you could just speak to that. Sure. So um, the MBLC, one of their conditions that they had wanted to use have us sign a contract by twelve thirty one, which is not going to happen. Um, so we've asked for a three month extension just to give us more time. My question had been I I was confused. Then are we, um, will the contractors be asked to hold their quotes? Because they've been asked to hold it till the end of the calendar year? The No, the contractors, uh, the, the due date for the contractors to hold their quotes is in January, mid-January. So that's the, that was in the, in the bid documents itself. So if we need to go beyond that date, they would be asked to hold their bids. Any further questions, Jennifer? And so, and just to be clear, we, we went through the three months just because, just be safe, but we don't want to keep going back to them. We could have asked for 30 days, thought it's just as good to ask for three months to make sure we have it all in place. So it's to wait till the 106 review is complete. That's, that's a piece of it, yes. Are there any further questions? Uh, I sent you a town manager, I use town managers. I sent you a president's report if you have questions you can either raise them now or write me about them. Um, I did reformat it. Um, and so, and then with that, I'm going to go on just future agenda items. We, on the December 2nd, we do the state of the town. We received the other annual reports. I've already started receiving them, requested them about a month ago. Um, and then we have resolutions. We will be looking at the CPA appropriation for the track and field. Um, we might be looking at enterprise fund appropriations. 
um, vote on any other appropriations that finance may recommend, budget guidelines, town manager goals, finalize the evaluation memo. The roundabout for Amity Drive, um, the 225 calendar, and um, we will have an executive session where we will discuss town manager compensation. Are there any other questions? It's too much. Um, with that, are there any council comments? Bob. I just want to say, uh, thank the, uh, the town manager for sending out the memo today on the uh, speed limits in town, but I've already gotten a lot of requests to lower speed limits. So I'm just throwing this out to the council. If anybody hears of specific roads that people want, let me know and I'll put them all together in one request and then we can make a request to the town manager and to the superintendent of public works to see whether we could get uh, changes in, in speed limits okay. that beyond the ones that, because the map shows what the default speed limits are for roads other than, well, the specific speed limits for roads other than the default ones. Are there any other council comments? Then I make a motion to adjourn. I seek a second. Second, Devlin Gothier. Thank you. We move to a vote. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker is absent. Pat DeAngelis is absent. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. The, the meeting's adjourned. It's 1123.